Okay, so now we should be recording. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we have 68 people so far that have already logged in. We're going to wait a little bit more because we saw that over 150 people registered. So we're going to give a couple more minutes for other people to join. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we're excited to have you. This is the second webinar, as you know, of a series, but I'll stay quiet for a couple of minutes so that we can let other people uh, join in. For those of you that have already made it, thank you very much. Emilio? Yes, yes, I can hear you. And then later we will make the announcement for everybody so that we're going to have a, a lunch time, one hour for hanging out. So prepare your lunch if you haven't prepared your lunch yet, in order that from uh, 12 to 1 p.m. you can hang out because uh, you can have the opportunity to, to uh, interact uh, with all the, the public, not only the presenters. Yes, yes, and we'll, we'll show the agenda too so everybody knows. Um, so it looks like right now we have 80 people that are already logged in, 81, so the numbers keep on ticking up. So we're okay. going to wait just one more minute so we can have more folks join, and then we'll, we'll get started. Hi, Martin from London. Thank you for joining us. We now have 84 people that have already logged in. So everybody knows there's a chat feature in Zoom and several of us will be using the chat and that's where you'll enter your questions. We're just waiting another minute so that folks can join. We have 87 now that have already logged in. Please feel free to use the chat if you want to enter your contact information, um, anything else that you want to put into that chat, uh, ask questions to the presenters while they're presenting, that's fine. We have a, a group of people that are looking at the chat, they're copying and pasting these questions into a Google Doc that then I'm using to ask questions so please feel free to use the chat. We want to encourage as much interaction as possible in the chat at all times. Okay, so let's get started. Thank you everyone. Right now we have 89 people that are currently online. Thank you all for joining us. So as many of you know, this is a second webinar of two webinars that we ca we're calling Sargassum Issues and Solutions. This is the second year that we do this. The webinar last week was focusing on presentations from government officials. So we had representatives from Miami-Dade County, also the village of Kibiscane and Monroe County. And they were talking about the issues that they're facing with sargassum, how they work with sargassum. And they had a lot of questions also for the audience and the scientists. So this webinar, webinar two, is where we're focusing on bringing together lots of scientists, lots of professionals that have been working on sargassum for a long time 
also on the solutions front, so we can help continue the conversation from webinar one. So let me go here to the next slide about the organizers. So my name is Emilio Lopez, I'm the co-founder and CEO of SOP Technologies. The SOP stands for a mission, which is to stop ocean pollution. And I have also partnered with companies that provide solutions to address issues related to sargassum. So if you have any questions about solutions later on, feel free to reach me, but you will have people that are presenting today that you can contact and talk about these types of solutions. We also have uh, Dr. Valentina Caccia. She's an environmental resources project supervisor. She's a scientist. She also works with Miami-Dade County's Department of Environmental Resource Management. And she's one of the uh, organizers as well. We've been working together on this a lot. And last but not least, we have Dr. Josefina Olascuaga. She's a professor at the University of Miami and she's a physical oceanographer. She will be presenting as well. So many of you already uh, heard this last time, so I'll go through this quickly. Uh, we understand that sargassum is very important. If for the environment, it's a natural phenomenon, it's, it's necessary. Um, but when there's too much of it in the wrong places at the wrong time, it impacts the businesses, also beach goers, and there are lots of different solutions to consider in terms of how you analyze these impacts and how you address them. So because of this, we need to have a multi-sector, multidisciplinary approach that considers a lot of different areas and specialties in order to manage sargassum effectively. We also know that sargassum is a regional issue. So you can see here, there's this uh, chart on the top right that shows that depending on the year, you have more sargassum or less sargassum reaching South Florida. But we do need to understand that this is here to stay. So this is where we're having these conversations so we can plan for the future. Lastly, uh, these webinars, uh, we do have a lot of participation from around the world, but we're trying to focus a little bit on South Florida in terms of what solutions can we implement in South Florida that have already been, been implemented elsewhere. What lessons can we learn from elsewhere around the world so that we can be as effective as possible in South Florida, bringing the knowledge from others. And I hope that you know, this uh, list of presenters here will help with that as well. So here's the agenda for today. We have uh, Dr. Joaquin Trinanes from NOAA and the University of Miami. We also have Dr. Josefino Lascuaga from UM, Dr. Elena Solo Gabriel, also with Afifa Aleman from the University of Miami, Dr. Joe Serafi from NOAA and the University of Miami, Dr. Ligia Collado Vides from Florida International University. And then on the solution side, we have uh, Joel Gonzalez from, he's an oceanographer, he's in Mexico from uh, Asocian. And we have Dwayne Benish from Elastic, and he works on sargassum barriers. After all of these presentations are about 10 minutes each, we'll have a longer questions and answers session. So please feel free to type in all your questions using the chat feature in Zoom. While you're hearing the presentations, that's fine. We're logging all of these questions. And then I'll ask them to the, to the different presenters during this uh, extended Q&A session. Then Dr. Josefino Lascuago will provide her closing remarks. And right after that, we're going to keep the webinar open so that if you're available after 12 p.m. and you want to continue from 12 to 1, we're going to keep the recording on. Um, the webinar is finished, but we want to have more time for people to have conversations. This is actually by popular demand. So um, this was asked for by a lot of people that wanted to talk more about these sargassum issues. They felt that they needed a little bit more than two hours. So we are providing this extra time after the webinar for that purpose. And Valentina will be the one leading those discussions at that time. So with that said, let's get started with the first presentation. Uh, Dr. Joaquin Quinanes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. I'm Perfect. Going to stop sharing my screen on my end. Yes. So Josefina, can you share your screen? Josefina, I think you're muted. I am, yeah, I'm sharing now. Let, give me a minute. Let me see if it's up. Can you see it now? Okay. Joaquin? Yes. Okay, good morning, uh, everybody, and, and thank you very much for inviting me to, to participate in this webinar. Well, my name is Joaquin Trinanes. Uh, I'm here as uh, operations manager for the Coastwatch Caribbean and, and Gulf of Mexico a regional node 
and I also am the operations manager for uh, Atlantic Ocean Watch. Uh, both nodes are hosted by the Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory in AML in Virginia Key, Miami. So uh, in this presentation, I, I will try to describe some of the work that we're doing, monitoring Sargassum and, and developing the tools to generate and visualize and, and validate sargassum related products. Uh, next slide, please. So first, uh, to, to Coast and Watch. Uh, so the, the main objective of Coast Watch and Ocean Watch, this is a NESDIS program, uh, is to provide uh, high quality satellite products uh, well, mo most of them are satellite products, but we also provide in-situ data and products from, from models. Uh, and we do this uh, within an interoperable architecture. Uh, many of those products are operational um, and can be used to, to support many applications. So as, as a very quick note, uh, let's pay attention to the left bar. Uh, it, has a it has a clear intention here. This represents the pipeline, the flow of data, from, from the data collection to the application, data from, from satellites, from in situ platforms, from models, from edge devices, for example, of the Internet of Things, um, and other inputs are, are being integrated, transformed, uh, merged, stored, um, they are checked, for example, for, for quality, uh, and they are shared uh, using techniques uh, such as, for example, machine learning, uh, cloud technologies, big data, data analytics. Uh, and, and the intention is to generate value-added products for, for the lower layer in the slide that represents the, the product consumers. Next slide, please. So here we have some representative applications um, and some key users and, and partners. So the list of products we distribute can be applied to many purposes. Uh, fisheries, for example, that they are mostly interested in temperatures and ocean color. Oil platforms that they are interested, for example, in ge geostrophic currents and other altimeter data. Uh, research cruises, uh, hurricane operations, public health, uh, biogeography. Uh, there is also a genomic component. Uh, there are coastal environment applications that uh, focuses on, on using the new generation of uh, satellites that, pro that provides high resolution data and, and operational oceanography in, in general. So we use our system to, to, to collect the data and to distribute the data the, and products and, and to visualize uh, the data, for example, from, from platforms such as Argo, gliders and, and others. And we also provide the tools to monitor uh, the operations, for example, of the ship of the 20 carbon fleet to study ocean acidification and estimate carbon fluxes. Uh, next slide, please. So some of these products are, are global, for example, temperatures, currents, winds, or they are regional. Uh, there, is, there are, for example, specific models for ocean acidification and heat content. Uh, and other are, are local, for example, um, those algorithms, regional algorithms uh, for water quality. So the, the local products take advantage of the availability of high resolution satellite data, uh, as well as all the new computing capabilities and, and data storage uh, capabilities. So uh, in addition, we, we have direct access to the satellite data collected by the antenna IOML, the one on the left. Um, that covers the, give us a, a great coverage of the whole, uh, the whole Caribbean and, and Gulf of Mexico regions. So this is very important to, to be able to generate and distribute products in near real time. Next slide, please. So uh, a very important aspect is the interoperability. So we want the users to be able to access and integrate those products within the world environment. So if, for example, you are a scientist using MATLAB, you can do it. If you are a decision maker uh, using GIS software, uh, I'm thinking, for example, RGIS, QGIS, uh, UDIG, and others. So you can also access those, those products. So there are number, a, a large number of clients that can be used. So imp we implemented web, web services that rely on protocols such XML and standards as XML, JSON, GML, but users don't, must not worry about that. 
but they can transparently uh, access those those products. So summarizing, uh, following these standards is uh, is very much easier to access, to understand, and to use those products that we serve. Understand because the metadata is also involved, um, and this makes the communication between computers and applications very much easier. And, and this is very important. If we have different data providers, each of them with different formats, protocol, and, and platforms. So. The, the figure at, at, at the bottom is an example of one of our Sargassum products, in this case, uh, that is integrated into the UDIC environment. Next slide, please. So our interest in Sargassum started in the Dewar Horizon oil spill. We were providing satellite data to monitor the oil spill, uh, mostly optical, but um, at some point, uh, we realized that, uh, one, well, one of the traditional best ways to detect oil spill is through radar data, what we call SAR. So there are uh, some areas giving false positives, and those areas correspond to sargassum mats. So uh, what the satellite imagery detected as oil in reality was sargassum. So we implemented a way to detect th those areas. So the sensor providing that the, the data dies some months later, but this trigger our interest in, in Sargassum. Next slide, please. So uh, moving forward, at the University of South Florida, Chong Mihu developed this algorithm to detect Sargassum from, from MODIS and, and BEERS. The, the, the product is called AFI, and, and it stands for Alternative Routing Alga Index. It has a resolution of one kilometer, so we integrated those products into our environment, creating daily, uh, three-day, and weekly cumulative fields. So we also started generating fields at 300 meters from the Olki sensor on board the um, Sentinel-3B-A and Sentinel-3B satellite constellation. So this is a very nice product. Uh, we call it uh, MCI, Maximum Chlorophyll Index, especially in the coastal region, as, as the resolution is very much better and, and the level of, of detail is also, is also better. So in, in the coastal area, we usually rely on in-situ servers. Now satellites can provide data for, for those areas. So you can see the difference between AFI and MCI in, in this slide. So the, the figure on the left is the three-day AFI field for July 16th, and the figure on the right is the MCI field on June 24th at 300 meter resolution. So as you can see, one of the advantages of, of satellite data is the synoptic capability. So they, they can see a large area at the same time. So, uh, and the main problem is the presence of, of clouds that prevent for uh, other information about the, the sargassum structures uh, just below the clouds. Next slide, please. So on, on the left, you can see how the distribution of the sargassum mats on June 23rd match with in situ sargassum observations that uh, are represented by green icons. On, on the left image, you can see some green areas uh, and uh, over the coastal region. So this, um, these in situ observations are really important because it's, it's important to verify and validate the products being generated using, using satellite data. Next slide, please. So we have also the capability to, of generating sargassum-related fields at 20 meter resolution from the MCI sensor on board Sentinel 2A and, and 2B. Uh, another source of, of high resolution data is, for example, Landsat. Uh, in, that, in the image on the left, you can see the red lines over the ocean uh, represents uh, sargassum. So this was taken on June 24th. And, and, and the image on the right, is from the Sargassum Watch project that is managed by FIU, Florida International University. It's, it's around that time. So the, the area is, uh, is Hollywood, um, that is um, a few miles north of Miami. So Josefina will probably mention how these satellite products will be used as uh, initial conditions for the trajectory models. The reason is simple. The presence of Sargassum doesn't, doesn't always imply that those maps will reach the shore. So that is the importance of good trajectory models. So I think that Josefina will talk about, about this later. Next slide, please. So as a value added product and in collaboration with USF, AOML and Coswatch also generate weekly sargassum inundation reports. Uh, uh, the reason is to provide a measure of the maximum risk of having coastal inundation of, of sargassum. Uh, and we use satellite data. 
uh, and we use the distance as a core indicator. So we're improving these reports by incorporating more satellite sources in order to minimize the, the gaps that most are mostly from clouds. Um, and we also implemented a survey to, to provide in situ sargassum data. So uh, the reports incorporate information about the floating algae density, uh, the colors you see in, in, in the map, um, and they also include the geostrophic currents, the, the, the yellow arrows there. So all these and, and, and other products are, are available from our web pages in, in multiple formats. Next slide, please. Finishing. So we also develop uh, a viewer where near real time uh, historical data sets can be, can be displayed. In the figure, you can see uh, the MCI fields uh, for Northern Florida uh, with a cloud cover that is from, from GOES and, and you can see the sargassum mats uh, below. This is from yesterday, but uh, I, I created this figure just two, three hours after the satellite pass. Next slide, please. With this viewer, you can create animations and overlay different data from different days, etc. Uh, so as a quick conclusion, we, we intended to highlight the importance of providing open and interoperable products. And, um, and this is not only for, for sargassum, this, this is uh, in general. Uh, I think it's, it's the best way to make different parts work together. So we, on, we also want to highlight the importance of improving the range of sargassum-related products from satellites, in situ observations, models, integrating all, all of them. I think that this, uh, this, this can be a way to better understand the, the main processes that govern the growth of sargassum and its distribution. Next slide, please. Well, this is the final slide with, uh, you can see there the contact information and, and some, link, or some links, uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for that, um, Dr. Pinanes. That was very informative. So if anybody has any questions for him, please feel free to add it to the chat. Um, I know the chat has been very active, which is great. Um, if you don't know how to check uh, your chat, just uh, scroll onto Zoom. You might see uh, something on the bottom banner that says, uh, has a little chat icon. And uh, lots of people are active there. Currently we have 123 participants on this. So it's really good, a really good turnout we have today. So please feel free to add your questions there uh, into the chat. So for the next uh, presentation, I don't want to delay things. Um, Dr. Lascoaga, uh, would you like to uh, take it from here? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everybody. So I, I will present a little more about the, how we can use the satellite data that Joaquin was saying and how we can incorporate this to uh, prediction models. Um, before going there, I just want to uh, tell you that this is a work, it's ongoing work and also plans for future uh, with a team from Miami, uh, University of Miami, from NOAA, and, and Nathan for Ecological Associate. Okay, so uh, as we were, as, as Joaquin was saying, even though we can see offshore mats, it doesn't mean that this will get to the, to the shore. So we ha have to take into account that we are talking about floating material, right? So the wind will also be uh, important for the transport of, of the sargassum mats. Uh, so this is very different to how water is moving. So we have to, um, we have to integrate the, the current and the wind in, in the model. So I will present today some of the efforts that we, are, we have been doing in theory, field experiment, and also in the wave, uh, in the wave tank, so lab experiments. The ultimate goal is to build a prediction system. Okay, so we started all this work uh, uh, with colleagues in, in NOAA uh, uh, with field experiments where we deploy things of different shapes. And as well, you can see here in the, in the picture, we were putting some uh, pseudo, what we call it pseudo sargassum. So each of these shapes has a GPS. So we follow uh, the trajectories. Actually, I will show some results, but we, we could follow this for, for many months. Dr. Lascoaga, it looks like your slides are not advancing on our end. I'm not no. sure. Yes, no. I, I don't see it advancing and there's somebody else also saying that in the chat. So now I, I am in field experiments. Okay, I was there. 
Okay, now? Now I see it, the field experiment slide. Yep. And now? Yep, I see the field experiment slide. No, it's not moving. Okay. Uh, yes, it's not changing. Okay, so maybe I will do it like this or it's not? Um... I think that works. I can see it. I can see it well. Okay. So I was saying that uh, we did several field experiments uh, with NOAA. Uh, they deploy uh, objects of different shapes, including what we call pseudo sargassum. So all of these objects has a GPS. So we, we track them and we study them, the, the trajectories. And this is what I will be presenting today. So, sorry, I, I, I will focus today in an experiment in the Florida current right offshore of Miami and another one uh, close to Puerto Rico. So results from the Florida current, uh, these are six day long trajectories. They were deployed all together. Uh, we have an, a cube and a sphere the, and the pseudo sargassum. And we can see that they go uh, mostly together for the first couple of days. The color is the wind intensity, but after a wind event at, around the day two, the trajectories diverge, even though the objects were not that different. So the question is why, and, and we will focus on the buoyancy to explain how this, uh, the wind affects differently each of these uh, objects. So the model to take into account uh, um, the wind to, to, uh, was, I mean, you, you, I will put the reference after, but it's a paper last year from uh, Verón Vero, Las Cuagas Mirón. And the, the idea is to, uh, we take into account all the possible forces uh, that can be um, a, a ball that can, is at, at the interface, right? So first of all, you will have friction from the water and the wind. You will have the, the ball that is moving is carrying along some water. So you have an added mass and so on. So if you take all this into account, um, I have the simplified formula here where the velocity of the ball will be a proportion between the velocity of the current, the water, and uh, as well as a proportion of the wind. So this is alpha uh, parameter that you can see there is what we call a windage. And the important is that from the theory, what we can get is that the, the windage will be a function of the buoyancy, being how, how much of the ball is below water and how much is above water. That is, a, uh, you can measure it with the density of the ocean and the density of the, of the ball. So this was uh, obtained theoretically, uh, but we did a, a, a wave experiment where we can uh, know perfectly or almost perfectly, what is the wind and the motion of the water in the, in the wave tank. So you can see in the figure that we have uh, four balls uh, and they were uh, all, um, all below water, half below water and so on, right? So and we test these under different currents and, and, and wind intensities. And what you have on the right figure is the, uh, the windage as a function of the buoyancy in, in red dots are the observations with the error bars being all the experiments that we did in the wave tank. And you can see how the windage increase as the differences in buoyancy uh, and, and in the black line is the, the value predicted by the, by the theory, and you can see a very nice uh, match. So if we compare that with some of the experiments we did, um, this is for the Florida current. I wanna remind you that the theory is, is mostly, I mean, we, we adapted this for different shapes, but it's for a ball, for a sphere. So in the central figure, you, we have the sphere where the windage, theoretical windage was approximated 3%. And, uh, the break line and the, and the shade is the model prediction in comparison with the uh, complete line that is the observation. And you can see a nice match. I wanna clarify here that the current and the wind were daily and the observation were every six hours. And also the, the, model, the, the current was, uh, the resolution for the current was 25 kilometers, so it was not great. But even though all these things, you can see on the, on the left, the prediction for the sargassum also match nicely uh, in time and position 
you can see more resolution on the observation, of, of course, because of the resolution problem I was telling you about the, uh, in the current. Same thing for the other shapes. Okay, but this is for pseudo sargassum. The, the next experiment I wanna point out is experiment done in, in Puerto Rico. And this, the results of this experiment uh, are in a paper this year led by Nathan Putman. Um, from the observer, in, in the map, you can see in green, the trajectories of pseudo sargassum and in, in yellow, the trajectories of real sargassum that we attach um, a, a GPS. Uh, they were not deployed together, but they were uh, less than a week uh, in time in, in around the same position. But one of the things that you can see is that they actually do not follow uh, the same uh, pattern. Um, so first thing, we may want to think about a, a better proxy for pseudo sargassum, um, not because of the trajectory, because they were not deployed together, but mostly because the wind is inferred from both, um, um, from the pseudo sargassum and sargassum were actually not the same. For the pseudo sargassum, the, the prediction, the, the observation uh, infer windage was close to the theoretical value around 1%, but for the actual sargassum, it was much, high, much higher. Uh, so we, we see here the need to improve the, uh, the theory uh, for actual sargassum, and we, I will present a couple of slides about that, but also the necessity of doing more field and lab experiments that involve a, a real sargassum. So the first step for the model of, of, of sargassum is that this is reported in Veron Vera Miron 2020, is that we actually, what we actually do not have just one uh, ball, right? Uh, as the theoretical model was, uh, was done. Uh, this is a, an elastic network where we consider many, many branches as you have in the sargassum. So we have a new uh, force to take into account this elastic uh, network, the Hugh law here. And I, um, more details you can see in the paper, but I want to just show one slide showing the differences of consider or not considering the network in blue in the map. Uh, sorry, the black is the trajectory uh, where we start the point and the, this is an eddy here. And you can see in blue, if you do not consider the network where the blue dots end up starting on the beginning of the black line. And in red, if you consider the, uh, elast the elasticity. And this is compared with a satellite image on, on the right where you see how the sargassum is, uh, has a tendency to get trapped uh, uh, with the, within this uh, uh, eddy. Okay, so we, we have been uh, working uh, to understand, to better understand how things that float in the ocean moves. So we know it's not just the water, it's the wind. And many people were adding windage to the sargassum model, but the question is how much of the wind? So what will be the factor to add? Um, so the plan for future is to incorporate, and we have this model, as I said, but we need to incorporate now a, a good velocity field and, and a wind and waves uh, to the model uh, to move to, to be forcing that uh, trajectory model, starting from uh, observation from satellite. And this is not only uh, data from models, but we, as well from uh, any available observation in the region. I put here a figure from radar, even though not all the radars in the region are active now, there are plans to, to have more radars uh, in the area. So, uh, the plan is, and actually we already uh, coordinate something with Miami Day Parks to share data uh, with them and provide to the end user is a probabilistic uh, landing uh, a map and to compare that with uh, actual observation they, they are providing. Like uh, if there is no sargassum, it's low, moderate or, or, or high. So, um, 
so more details of the model I can give or we can discuss later, but just uh, for the time I have, just final, uh, some final thoughts. Um, first of all, the, 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 the need to identify the initial condition from satellite and it's good, we are having every day more resolution on this. Joaquin was reporting 20 meters resol uh, resolution, which is great. So um, knowing in advance, we, we heard this from last webinar, that will help them to plan, uh, to better plan the removal. Uh, so the modeling is not also just for prediction, but we can analyze this to identify preferred pathways, for example. So that given certain uh, ocean and atmospheric conditions that we can know a priori. Um, so as I said, more, more, more studies on the theory and lab experiment and field experiment are also needed, but of course, none of these can be done if we don't have a, a dedicated uh, funding. So some reference, so you can check later in the, uh, in the record. Um, and that's it for me, thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lascuaga. I see that some people already started uh, typing questions in the chat for you. We'll look at those later on. Okay. If anybody else has any questions, please feel free to add them to the chat. Uh, Dr. Lascuaga, that's a fantastic presentation. Uh, without further ado, let's move on to the next presentation. We have Dr. Uh, Solo Gabriel and also Afifa uh, joining us. So Afifa, please feel free to start sharing your screen. Thank you. All right. Can everyone see the screen? Yes, 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 we can, full screen now. Okay. Um, I'd like to go ahead and get started, and I would like to thank the organizers for this opportunity. I also like to thank the village of Key Biscayne for this opportunity to do this research. I am Helena Solo Gabriel. I am joined by FIFA. We're both from University of Miami, along with our collaborator, James Klaus. I'd also like to acknowledge our collaborators from NOAA, Mary Beth Gidley and Christine Galliano. Next slide. Um, as we know, beach monitoring is uh, conducted through Miami-Dade Department of Health. They collect samples weekly and they measure for a bacteria um, of indicator of fecal contamination called enterococci. And when enterococci levels are above a certain threshold, in this case 70 CFU or colony forming units per 100 milliliters, beach advisories are then issued. So as you can see on the plate on the left with the blue dots, each of those represents a colony. And with the number of dots or blue dots goes above 70, that's when the beaches tend to be closed. Next slide. The village of Key Biscayne um, was interested in identifying what the sources of enterococci were to its beaches. We identified or we focused on three different sources. The first one was sewage from the Central District Wastewater Treatment Plant. Uh, we looked at operational parameters. We also did some very simple modeling. And our conclusions were that there was no evidence to indicate that the sewage from the wastewater treatment plant was impacting Key Biscayne Beach. In addition to that, um, we were also interested in looking at human and animal sources through a process called microbial source tracking. We will not be presenting on that. Uh, but Afifa will allude to this at the end of the presentation. So during this presentation, we want to focus on the source of seaweed um, as illustrated here. And I'd like to turn it over to Afifa. All right, thank you, Dr. Solo. So what I'm going to talk to you about is a little bit of the sample collection that we did at the village of Key Biscayne. So we do collect water samples. We collect three to four sand samples, and we also collect a seaweed sample. So with the seaweed sample, we also measure it for uh, moisture content. And then based off of the moisture content, we then uh, uh, classify it as being fresh, senescent, or decomposing. So this is the, a little bit of the samples that we collect. So to give you a visualization of where the water sampling locations are located, we collect in the ankle water, the knee water, and also the wastewater. And again, the wastewater is where the Miami-Dade Department of Health also collects their samples. And again, this is, if there's an exceedance of over 70, this is where the sample will be collected and the advisory would be uh, issued. 
So the sediment samples are uh, very interesting. So we have the super tidal zone, which is that dry sand that you kind of walk into as soon as you enter onto the beach. You have your intertidal sand, which is collected right below your ankle water. And you have your subtidal sand, which is collected right below the knee line or where your knee water is collected. And the seaweed is collected anywhere along the beach. And Key Biscayne is very unique because they integrate their sand and seaweed. So you can see the stark difference in between the uh, what we consider the super tidal and that rich organic matter with the seaweed mixed into the sand. So you can see the stark difference between the two samples. So I just want to play for you a little video about how Key Biscayne integrates their seaweed and sand. So the tractor is being pulled across the seaweed and sand and then it's collected and then it spits out the uh, mixed uh, seaweed and sand at one end. So this is how and then so the results for the bacteria by culture that we've collected for uh, March 2019 to March 2020, you can see from the graph that there is the seaweed does exhibit higher levels of bacteria uh, overall for all of the samples that we have collected. And again, this is on a log scale, so it's a little bit exaggerated, but overall seaweed has had higher levels of bacteria than the sand samples and the water samples that have been collected. And again, the, the threshold is um, 70 CFUs per 100 mils. So we kind of broke up our sampling into two different periods. So we have the March 2019 and March 2020 as one period. And we also have this beach closure during COVID. And we also collected when the beaches were open. So we kind of broke it, our study up into two different um, sampling times. So you can see that from the before from the March 2020 to March 2019 to March 2020, we kind of have a high level in the ankle water. And then right before we have the, um, COVID, the beach closure during COVID, you can see that all of the levels drastically decrease. And again, no people are, are on the beach during the beach closure. So there isn't that human interaction with the beach environment and the bacteria. So you can see that there is a drop in the bacteria levels. And then as soon as the beaches are open again, you can see the bacteria levels are starting to climb up uh, in the water samples. So for the sand samples, which is the graph below, you can see we collect the supertidal, the intertidal, and the subtidal samples. And during our March 2019, March 2020 period, we can see that the supertidal consistently had higher levels of bacteria compared to our subtidal and our intertidal samples. And whenever there was an integrated sample collected, that sample normally uh, has higher levels of bacteria that's found in this zone. So you can see, again, during our beach closures during COVID, all, all of our bacteria levels besides our integrated sample has significantly decreased. And you can see right when the beaches are starting to open back up, we kind of see that super tidal um, peak again during this time period. So this graph, this plot basically shows you our fresh seaweed samples that have been collected during our time of study. So with this, it's very interesting to note that the fresh seaweed, it, it normally has, tends to has lower um, levels of bacteria during our earlier sampling time. And then you can see right before our um, beach closure or during COVID, we kind of had a high spike in our fresh. And then during, especially during COVID, you can see that the beach closure during COVID, you can see that the bacteria levels in our fresh sample were practically below detection. And you can, again, you see the trend of it trying to increase um, during our beaches opening up. And again, I just want to point out to you that there is a difference, sorry, there is the difference between the integrated sand sample that's been collected. So again, the blue dots are the bacteria that we count and you can see S4, which is our integrated sand sample. You can see that the amount of bacteria that's collected on the plate. So this is just adding the senescent seaweed samples that we have collected. And again, our senescent is a little bit, it's a, um, a little bit more dry than our fresh seaweed. So you can see that it is variable, but you can see the stark spikes between our fresh seaweed that's been collected and our senescent seaweed. So the senescent seaweed overall tends to have higher levels of bacteria than our fresh samples that are collected. 
And finally, what we have is our decomposing seaweed samples that are collected. So our decomposing seaweed samples that are collected, you can see from the graph, there are about four to five um, sampling times that are above, way beyond this scale that we are showing you here. Um, they are in the thousands range, with CFUs per, hundred gra uh, per gram of dry sand. So again, you can see that the decomposing seaweed has very high levels of bacteria. And um, that's kind of what we are trying to see and look at for today. So some of the conclusions that we've come up with within our, within our study is that seaweed, when it's very dry, it is a source of bacteria to the beach. And the dry sand, when the beaches are open, are, is a possible source of bacteria. So when the beaches are open, we kind of see that dry sand have higher levels of bacteria. And when beaches were closed, that dry sand had very low levels. And this was only possible with the beach closures that we had experienced during COVID. And again, with our integrated sand samples, which is the mixing of the seaweed and the sand, it is very variable during COVID. So all of this is dependent on the amount of seaweed or sargassum that's coming in and how often it's integrated into the sand at Key Biscayne. So for the next steps for our project, we really wanna look at the MST, the microbial source tracking for the integrated sand and see where the sources are coming from, whether they're human, their dog or their bird sources. And then I'd like to pass it over to Dr. Solo. Thank you, Afifa. Um, given the discussions last week, I also wanted to briefly mention um, that we did receive a notice of award for a research project to look at compost as a means to recycle sargassum. This, is, um, this notice was received from the Hinckley Center for Solid and Hazardous Waste Management. It is contingent on funding through the state, um, and so we're still waiting to get official official word. Um, but this proposal was written by AFIFA um, and included myself, Dr. Peter Swore, and Dr. Amanda Olert. Um, and it includes uh, looking at compost, uh, tumbler composts and compost piles. I also wanted to thank Valentina for her ideas, sharing her ideas and input as we were preparing this particular proposal. I also like to thank uh, Dr. Ligia from FIU, um, who also has helped us in identifying the different seaweed species that we have been collecting at the village of Key Biscayne. And at this point, I'd like to say thank you and we'll monitor the chat. Thank you for that great presentation. I, I think it's fantastic that you're showing data that was collected uh, locally here at Key Biscayne because we do, you know, we do know that this again is a regional issue, but we're trying to focus it as much as possible today on the South Florida impacts, especially in this area. So I really appreciate that you're able to share these numbers with us. So for the next presentation, we have uh, Dr. Serafi. So Dr. Serafi, would your team like to uh, start sharing your screen? Hi, everybody. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Yes. My colleague, Jingang Liu, is uh, gonna be advancing the slides. So Jingang and I are um, old friends. We um, are both researchers at the University of Miami. And um, uh, this is going to be a little bit of a different talk because with all the sophistication and, uh, uh, that we've heard in the previous talks, uh, this is pretty primitive. In fact, I'm going to tell you uh, about a, a project done by a high school student, happens to be Jin Gang's son, uh, on the invertebrates in the rack line. And in particular, one kind of uh, invertebrate, the talatrid amphipods, uh, which uh, occur on natural beaches. Um, I also work with NOAA, um, and, uh, uh, but this is very much a, um, a little project for an intern that kind of opened up a universe for me. Uh, next slide. Thank you, Jin Gang. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about what are known colloquially as beach hoppers or sand hoppers. Uh, they're about a millimeter uh, in length as adults, or two millimeters, and they occupy that intersection between the supertidal and the upper intertidal, as you can see in this diagram. There's a whole community of animals here, of course, and um, you know there are all sorts of food webs that are connected uh, to that rack line. Um, and I've always been interested in these little guys um, because occasionally they occur in incredible densities. So 
Uh, we'll go to the video now, uh, Jingang, to give you some idea of uh, just how, how thick these guys are in this intersection between the intertidal and the um, upper uh, and the supertidal. So, um, you know, I'm not an invertebrate expert. I'm not a, uh, a, a botanist by any stretch. Um, but just seeing these incredible densities of animals uh, got me thinking about a number of things. Um, and so when we had a volunteer high school student available, uh, we put him to work. Um, so some basic questions, uh, you know, when we, when, we, when we looked at this, and oh, by the way, this is a natural beach. This is not a groomed beach, which, which I'll try and allude to later on. But some basic questions were, what, what the hell are they? You know, what species? Um, how many are there? I mean, these things are, are, can occasionally be just, you can't count them um, visually. Uh, and then, you know, what do they eat and how much, which has some relevance to, uh, you know, accumulations on the, on the rack line. But there's a hundred other questions that I'm not going to be able to address in this talk um, that are really deserving of further research and, and perhaps even some citizen science uh, scientist uh, involvement uh, to answer them, uh, including, uh, you know, um, uh, the environmental variables that correlate with their densities, um, the big question that we had uh, last time about, you know, whether uh, what they're eating uh, might be, um, uh, you know, they may be accumulating heavy metals or arsenic that they then contribute to the food web. Um, but my initial interest was to see if these animals could potentially be a source for aquaculture or the aquarium industry. Um, won't be able to cover these things uh, during this, this 10 minutes. Next slide, please. Um, so the first, the first question is, is what are they? And um, uh, this is a very, there's over 10,000 species of amphipods and, and there's literally hundreds of these beach hopper type uh, species. So we, we had to get an expert. Uh, Jim Thomas, who was at NOVA, he's, he's retired, but he kindly looked at some of our samples and we're, he was pretty sure they belonged to the genus Mexorchestia. Um, species not quite known right now. Uh, so, you know, these are obviously crustaceans, um, amphipods, and uh, it's the Talidae uh, family that have pretty much uh, semi-terrestrial existence. They don't have any life stage that's in the water. And IDing them is no, is, is no picnic. Um, so luckily uh, we, had, we had the help of somebody, but this is an area that needs uh, further, further work. Um, next slide. So what do we do? We, you know, we're muddy boots biologists, Jing Gang and I, and so we put together you know, a little pilot project for, for, for Jing Gang's son, David. And, you know, um, not very sophisticated uh, equipment needed, but what you can see is that we set out a 30 meter um, uh, tape measure. Uh, we randomly sampled along uh, that 30 meters uh, every month. Um, that, uh, that implement to the left that looks like a pogo stick uh, is, a, is a sod uh, cutter. Um, what it did is it, um, is it cut out a three by three by three inch cube of sand, uh, uh, macrophytes, uh, and of course the animals. And then, you know, we, we, we sieved them. We used a one millimeter mesh uh, uh, sieve, uh, put them in the freezer, um, and, and then counted them. Next slide. So how many? Um, the first question, well, uh, in the upper, uh, we did 13 sampling events for about a year, uh, approximately every month. And on, on the upper graph, you can see on a log scale that our average was 13,000 or so individuals per square meter, which is pretty, which is a lot. Um, uh, certainly they dominate numerically and in, in, in terms of biomass, uh, these, these sites. Uh, on the graph to the, at the bottom is, um, is uh, 
shown by month. And you can see that the peak is in the summer, uh, June, July. Next slide. So one, one obvious question. Oh, sorry. My apologies. Um, one obvious question is, can these guys effectively remove uh, the, the, the sargassum? And um, uh, um, next slide. Here's a video, uh, uh, a little bit blurry, and hopefully it'll work. But these things are herbivores, and they eat like crazy. Um, uh, so, you know, 13,000 animals, how much can they remove um, uh, from a square meter that gets, that gets an accumulation of, of macrophytes? Next slide. So, some pretty basic math here. Um, uh, the animals that we collected, which were adults, um, so this is going to be an underestimate. Um, they, we, you know, their average weight was, was about uh, 22 uh, milligrams. Um, multiply that by our 13,000, and that's 411 grams per square meter on average, um, which uh, is about 0.91 pounds for those of you who don't think metric. Uh, and that is the equivalent of about uh, a beer can, a full beer can. So every square meter on average has uh, a beer can worth of these amphipods, um, which really surprised me. Next slide. We then did some feeding experiments, or actually David did, um, and uh, we got some, some help from Peter Glynn and Sharon Smith in terms of uh, equipment and lab space. And we did some experiments where we put individuals in with sargassum and other uh, types of seagrass and, and basically uh, saw how much they ate. Uh, and this is what we found is that they eat approximately two and a half, two, two and a quarter uh, of their body weight per day per individual. So, next slide. Oh no, let's stay, let's go back. Uh, uh, what that means is that they can remove um, 900 uh, uh, grams uh, per day. Um, or in other words, two pounds per square meter per day for those of us who, who, who don't think metric. Um, so that's a, a pretty impressive clearance rate. Um, obviously when sargassum uh, is, uh, amounts are, are huge, um, these guys uh, don't have much of an impact. Um, but that is how uh, the beaches uh, operate under natural conditions. Next slide. So yeah, of course, these guys are, uh, you know, part of a, of a food web. Um, uh, they are along, they are in the, in the rack line, uh, along with, with beetles and ants and spiders and, and crabs, uh, which are food for uh, a whole host of, of, uh, of, of sea shorebirds that we know, we know about, particularly plovers and sanderlings. Um, a big question is, of course, uh, you know, are the heavy metals and arsenic levels uh, uh, being introduced into, into the food web? Um, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and that food web also includes uh, juvenile fish that, that are right there in the splash zone, uh, including juvenile permit. And, I, and we'll, next slide, Jinge. Hopefully you'll be able to see uh, this video, um, which uh, shows uh, these small uh, juvenile permit that um, they basically are patrolling, looking for uh, amphipods uh, and other invertebrates uh, that, that, are, that are hopping around on, on the beach. So, you know, these, these terrestrial invertebrates do make it into uh, into, into uh, juvenile fish uh, diets, and, and therefore there's a potential connection to, to humans. Next slide. So uh, as far as a summary, these guys are, are really do dominate the rack line. 
um, both numerically and in biomass. Their densities are, are really variable, but you know, um, uh, 400 grams per, per square meter is, is pretty impressive. On average, uh, they consume uh, 2.25 uh, of their body weight per day. So, um, you know, they can, they can remove quite a bit of, 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 of uh, material per day. There are obviously, you know, important components of beach food webs. Um, their removal uh, and, and the burial of rack from beaches is obviously understandable and, 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 and necessary when these inundations come in, but there are ecological consequences, um, including the removal of the beach's natural rack uh, clearing capability and a general reduction in food resources for, for the natural ecosystem. I, I think the big question that hopefully uh, we'll be exploring is the extent to which um, uh, the sargassum and the amphipods are potentially uh, toxic. Um, and I think that's it there. Uh, I don't know what my time looks like. We do have uh, a couple of more videos, but we can, um, this, this is showing that, that, that these guys uh, basically have eggs that are underneath the pleopods of, of these creatures and the, uh, the young um, hatch fully developed uh, and, uh, and move around under the female. Um, we have another one. This is great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Is there is there contact information that you would like to share with us, by the way? Yeah. You have a lot of information here. I wouldn't want people to lose the opportunity to reach out. Yeah. I um, Joe.serafi at noaa.gov. Great, um, great. Thank, thank you, uh, Dr. Serafi. And by the way, uh, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to add it to the chat. Uh, we do have a, a team of people looking at the chat. We're copying and pasting all these questions into a Google Doc for the questions and answers ses session. Uh, thank you so much, um, Dr. Uh, Serafi. Also, uh, Jin Yang, for presenting and sharing your screen. I'm going to switch over here for our next presenter. Now, I know, let's see here. I need to make some quick changes here on my end. Okay. So now we have uh, Dr. Ligia Collado Vides from Florida International University uh, as the next presenter. Dr. Collado Vides, um, are you able to uh, share your screen with us for your presentation? And welcome. Uh, hello, Emilio. I think I'm sharing it. Let me see if you can see it. Uh, which one are you seeing? Because it... Yes, biological perspective of sargassum. Okay, is that, uh, is that what you're looking now? Yes, yes, full screen, thank you. Okay, so I don't know if you can see me or not because I am lost, but let me start and then I can say goodbye with my image. So first of all, thank you very much for everybody and what you guys are doing is just an amazing work for having all us together. I'm going to go relatively fast I have like two different tasks. What I'm going to be doing is talking a little bit about what is orgasm, the work of our lab that is very local, and then what we are doing with the SARCnet that is trying to bring some international collaborations as well as local collaborations. You can hear me well? Oh, what I'm not going to be talking at all is about any kind of ecosystem uh, impacts. Uh, this is a work that has been fantastically done with Brigitte and we are doing something here at Florida, but it's beyond a talk of 10 minutes. So what is sargassum? Sargassum is not a plant. It doesn't belong to the kingdom Animalia or, or Plantae. It has its own kingdom, Chromista, where you have diatoms and many other organisms that flagellate with their own taxonomic uh, and evolutionary um, history. We have more than 358 fully accepted species by the phycological community. From them, benthic species means that they live attached to the bottom are also causing different type of problems. They can be introduced and cause uh, a lot of invasions. Sargasmoticum was uh, causing a lot of problems in, the, in, in Europe, uh, Hornary in California. So the, the genus has something that has the ability to grow very fast. And the 
species that are for interest for us are the pelagic species, means that they can complete their life cycle within uh, floating. And two species have been identified, Sarcasum natans or Sarcasum fluitans. We see morphotypes. Morphotypes means that they are not still uh, already split in different species. And they might be perhaps going through a speciation process, and that makes them very difficult taxonomic group. Both the fact that they are chromista with a very complex taxonomic history, as well as they have an allopelagic life cycle. <clears throat> Here in Miami and Broward, the species that we are receiving are going to be two, sargassum natans and fruitans from the pelagic ones, and when you see them in the beach, you just see a mix. However, it's very important for us to identify at least the three different morphotypes of species that are arriving. So you will have sargassum fluitans, and you can see here, I hope that you can see in your screen, very characterized by a stipe with different spines, and they are uh, air bladders. I'm going to call them just bladders, are going to be a little bit more oblong, and they are robust algae. There is going to be sargassum natans one that is going to have a thin stipe, elongated. Usually you will see it very brown. The bladders are going to be very round and with a tiny spine, the plant is going to be more open. And then we have the more rare form that is going to be natans eight. It does not have any of the spines in the turn, in the, in the stipe, sorry, no spines in the stipe. And then in the blades, you can have different type of uh, epiphytes uh, and zoophytes that are going to be very different between the species. This is a robust, but a little bit wider than the fluitans, and usually it's easy for anybody to make a confusion for them. But they might have different ability to uh, keep moisture or, or anything when they start decomposing, they are going to have different decomposing rates as, as different species. Why is this important? I'm going to go very fast here. I'm not going to be talking anything about the oceanography explanations about how sargassum is distributing. It's starting in sargassum C, and there is a wonderful paper by Johnson 2020 about different hypotheses on how this great belt was built up. But in a taxonomic point of view, we can use it as a forensic tool. So happens that in the North Sargassum Sea, fluitans three and natans one are very common. But in the Great Belt, Sargassum natans eight is very common. So remember we are here in this tip in, the, in Florida, at the end of all of these uh, Caribbean islands and all of these currents that are bringing us Sargassum. So whatever type of morphotypes we're getting is going to be very important to understand how all of these Sargassum from the South and the North are coming. So that was just the introduction. Here I'm going to be talking about local results. Uh, Lowell I. Park, a student, a graduate student in the lab, is running a fantastic project. So we're dealing with a wide phenomenon, geographically wide, complex, and with very regular frequency. So this is something that he developed to respond to these kind of questions and trying to prove, well, provide information for modelers ground proofing. So community and science, because you cannot be a, a citizen of the place, but belong to the community. So this is something to analyze. This is uh, an app that you can use in your phone. And then please, please join the Picollect and to join this uh, email, uh, Lowell, uh, that um, email address there. And what we can offer with this type of result are going to be different observations that you can see just in 2019, more than uh, 900 observations were covering all of this geographical area. Or now in 2020, including the pandemic, we are in the 500s, including all of this area just for Florida. I cannot but mention that taking pictures from the front is going to allow us to also have an idea of the sarcasm brown uh, tide that can cause this kind of uh, arrivals of the sargassum blooms that I uh, do not like to call uh, golden tides because that can be a diatom as well. So for all of those that are doing managing in the beaches, having um, you as a team helping us might be very important because we realize that the groups that are going to be sending information daily and we can capture that, then we can transform the pictures into a series of 
categorical abundance from very high to very low to zero or not present. And if they complete the sarcasm epicolic uh, app, we can also have an idea of the frequency of the different type of morphotypes. So you can see here that we have fluidants uh, in, the, in this blue, we have natants eight in this green, and we have natants one in the pink. So we can actually see the variability. And all of these are uh, from a group that is working in NOVA sending us daily pictures. There's another group uh, by Samantha Osa, also, also a also student in my lab, and we need to have estimation in situ. So uh, in situ, we are doing the quadrat analysis, collecting the samples, and then analyzing the biomass. Here, when we uh, were in last Friday's meeting, I think that we can really have a wonderful collaboration with all, all of the beach managers. And what we are working now is trying to escalate the observations in biomass done by us in the field that takes a long time to try to see if there is any correlations with the picture abundances. And so far with some preliminary studies, we can see that we have a relatively good correlation and then we will be able to use the community citizens to transform into biomass. And if we are lucky and we have very good pictures, we can even have a wide geographical spectrum for Florida about the um, abundance and the frequency of the different type of morphotypes. The other part of the lab that we are doing is measuring nutrient content in the different species. And I'm not going to be very uh, deep in this. What I want to take a message from this is generally microphytes, marine microphytes, are going to have a nitrogen, more or less a 1.9 to 2% of the dry weight is going to be nitrogen. Something at 0.25% is going to be phosphorus. Those are going to be plants uh, or organisms that are primary producers that are not going to be limited by the availability of nutrients. Interestingly, the um, sargassum specimens that are landing are showing really a low level of nutrients. And this corresponds with the idea that these organisms are used to grow in very oligotrophic environments where they are poor in nutrients. So this is going to be a very interesting area to keep working. And also when we compare our data in this graph here in pink with data from Brian Lapointe in 1995, when we compare the proportion between nitrogen and phosphorus, we can see that it's very high. This is meaning that we have um, specimens arriving with very low amount of phosphorus. There are some debates between um, the ability to incorporate arsenic for those that are uh, organisms, primary producers that are going to be very low in phosphorus. So we have many more questions to address in this case. The bottom line and, and um, take home message is that the organisms are not showing very high levels of nutrients in their tissue. We also uh, did our preliminary studies of samples from build bags and crandom showing the uh, arsenic and other metals, but I'm just going to concentrate in the arsenic. Uh, in general, the brown algae are going to have a higher affinity for arsenic because they have alginates, and those alginates in the tissue are facilitating incorporation of arsenic. Our measurements from build bags and crandom are showing that in average they are around the 100 parts per million. That is really, really high. And we see that it's going to be a difference between the different morphotypes. So the take home message are two. We are having high levels of arsenic in our samples and they're going to be different between the different morphotypes that are landing in our uh, waters. Uh, I hope that you can actually see this. The idea is that the values that we are finding are very similar and within the range of those that have been recently published by a study, a very interesting and deep study done in Mexico as well. Still, a very important thing that we need to address is what are the species of arsenic that are present. And for some studies, uh, studying sargassum, it's realized that 80% of the arsenic in sargassum is organic. So we need to do much more uh, research into the metals. And I really recommend that we can stop, well, we can delay a little bit in thinking 
composting or food or any kind of things until we really understand a little bit more about the levels of arsenic. So this is in terms, my lab is doing the cities in abundance, nutrients and metals in different beaches. And these are preliminary studies. Now we have the fridge full until we can get back and work in the labs. So what is Saragnet? I'm going to jump very quickly to um, a more international aspects. And this is going to be the Sargassumnet discussion forum. This is a simple listserv that we created in 19, um, that means that I'm out of time. Um, I'm just going to finish very quickly, Emilio. Uh, we invite all of you to join. This is a list serve in which all the international community is working. Uh, Lowell is in working with this and already having international observations with the PICOLECT. And then in um, last October, we conducted in Texas A&M FIU, supported by the French government, the first meeting with 67 uh, experts. And I will leave you with this slide in which these are based on the 67 experts, the things that we need to do in order to address the problem of sargassum, education, management, identification of thresholds, common protocols. So we have a long way to go and this deserves all together just a working workshop. I just want to leave you with many, many lessons have been learned in the Caribbean a lot of work has been done in, in CERNs by um, Hazel uh, Oxenford and collaborators. This is a wonderful regional bulletin in which they are developing information tools, forecasting, managerial ideas, and uh, something that it, there is a lot of research going on in the Caribbean. The French are putting a lot of money. An alternative that is developed in Texas is using sargassum to create uh, dunes and they are working fantastically. And this could be an alternative to compost and any other things. So I will leave in there and please any questions. And I want just to thank you everybody. This is a work that we need to do together. It's not a moment to blame anybody. It's an international planetary problem. And I think sarcasm is just one answer. So thank you uh, all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gray Alavides. Um, I see that there was a lot of activity in the chat there. If anybody has any additional questions for her, uh, please add them on the chat. Uh, while you were speaking, uh, and added the email address so people can join Sarganet. I have seen lots of fantastic emails coming through uh, via that uh, email listserv for the past year. So I highly recommend if you're interested in the subject and you haven't joined, uh, please feel free to join. With that said, I want to uh, welcome uh, Joel Gonzalez, oceanographer. Uh, well, I'll leave it to you now for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, people. Can you hear me there? Yes. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. First of all, I need to address that I'm not a research scientist. I'm just an oceanographer, but I, I work more on the field uh, of, of practicity, and we be uh, working and having some expertise now on the sargassum since 2015 when we first uh, saw it in massive amount of amounts here in Mexico. And derivated from the last um, webinar last uh, Friday, we, we checked that um, you are right now in Florida as we were in 2015 doing a lot of tests and, and going through all these problems that you have right now. And um, we want to um, tell you that you don't have to start from zero because we do have some of the stuff already done here in the Caribbean, in Mexico in particular, where I work. So um, we are gonna talk a little bit about barriers because uh, it's, it's a delicate subject here, whether to use it or not. There is many different kinds of barriers. I can tell you here in Mexico, at least we have more, uh, 15 or more different kinds of barriers. Some of them work better than the other ones, but um, the idea of having barriers is, uh, first of all, to avoid the sargassum reaching the beach, which is very important for all these problems that they, they have been addressed already, uh, for the chemical composition, for a problem with the erosion on the beach, and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, barriers have been helping a lot uh, with uh, controlling the, the sargassum arriving to the beach. So uh, uh, um, 
putting the barriers in a proper manner, it will redirect the sargassum to specific collecting points where it's easy to work and deal with it. So we can remove it from the water. Uh, in this picture, you can see some of our barriers that we had in the water and this accumulating sargassum in one specific spot where we have actually um, and a special skimmer and remover that is taking the sargassum out of the water. So uh, they need to be properly installed and well maintained as well to, to be able to last several years. Uh, we talk about this last year webinar where I, I address how to in, uh, implement this, the barriers and also the anchoring, which is very important not to disturb the bottom and the bentos of, uh, of the installation. Uh, as I was saying, uh, research is fundamental for uh, the ideal uh, configuration of the barriers. It's not just putting one barrier there and that's it. We, we need to check on current tides and winds, depths, et cetera, et cetera, to make it uh, efficient and uh, less effective to the environment, right? Because uh, so we have in Mexico some of the rules and we call them lineamientos, which are the alignments for, uh, for the installation of barriers which they actually don't allow you to go all the way to the bottom because you need to leave some space for marine life to actually go underneath. And this is, um, sorry, I didn't find a picture of uh, turtles passing underneath, but well, you can see here on this picture that it's an eagle ray that is actually crossing under the barrier. And uh, this is the idea to allow marine life to, to keep moving in and out of the uh, protected area with barriers, right? But it's also very important if you're going to use a barrier to have some um, source of, of cleaning for the, for the sargassum because we cannot allow the accumulation of sargassum. When it's accumulated, it will start eventually dying. And when it dies, it sinks to the bottom. And basically, it will, it will pass underneath and it will start uh, decomposing and contaminating, as you saw on the prior presentation. So um, we have boats here, which are recovering sargassum or uh, we implemented uh, these systems, which are, uh, are uh, removers or skimmers from sargassum. It's very important to recover sargassum when it's in the water. Why? Because once it is in the sand, it will, it will provoke all these problems that we already mentioned, like, like erosion. Uh, uh, if you, um, what we are looking at now is uh, the potential use for sargassum after we've been, we collected, right? So if it's all full of sand, it makes it very difficult, almost impossible to actually exploit it or, or use it because you will need to clean it first from sand. And it, when you recover it from the sand, actually you are eroding the beach like a lot. So it's very important uh, uh, to avoid that the sargassum actually reaches the, the beach and we collect it from the beach. It also affects the, the composition and a very nice talk about uh, the bacteria that we can fi find over there. So it's important not to mix the sargassum with the, with the sand. And also the use of heavy machinery in compact sand and uh, the, the turtles, the marine turtles is a difficult issue as well to address. So it could affect the nesting and uh, the hatchlings as well because uh, it can compact the, the sand or it can collapse in the nests in case they pass over them, right? So it's very important to avoid a lot of accumulation of, of uh, seaweed because it makes it very difficult for hatchlings to go. And also if we have a lot of accumulation, it will start with the decomposing. And we know that if it's on the beach, the, they will create um, some uh, chemical uh, matters that we don't, we don't want on the beach, like, like uh, sulfidric acid, for example. No? So this will actually uh, kill all the animals live on the on the ventos or, or the sand so and it's also very important to have the uh, marine grass uh, healthy to to be able to have beaches right so the actions that we do have don't uh, we do not recommend to bury sargassum because it will decompose and return to the sea uh, eventually so it's very important not to do this practice we have to remove it uh, avoid the accumulation as i already mentioned and for this, we have different, different um, methods, right? One of our methods is the, we call this the skimmer sea turtle, where we recover the sand when it's still floating and it's alive. And uh, when you take it out of the water, actually it's clean. So we can, we can maybe use something 
of this orgasm. And we have, um, last week you were talking about some canals and some uh, like kind of rivers that you have over there in Florida. So we do have an option for these canals. So we could recover the sargassum uh, over there as, an, as another solution. Uh, regarding marine turtles, uh, what we do here is uh, some surveillance programs, uh, conservation programs, which are run by biologists. And the important thing is that to keep, try to keep the clean beach, the, the beach clean, sorry, because the big mammoths, the, the, the big turtles, they have no problem like going over it. They can pass actually all over the, the sargassum when it's not big, big, big amounts. But when they reach a place where they need to start like digging a hole, if they find a lot of sargassum, they won't nest and they will just go back to the beach, so to the ocean, sorry. So it's important to keep those clean. If they nest, what we do is uh, we do have some hatcheries where we relocate uh, eggs. So it's easy to have control when they, when they are born, the newborns, the hatchlings. So we can uh, know when they are gonna, are gonna explode, I mean, they're gonna hatch and then we can collect them and then liberate it on the beach that is on the side that is not protected by the barrier. Uh, more tests has to be run uh, about the, the, the barriers and the hatchlings. But at the moment, this is what is done. Or if you cannot relocate the nests, what we do is we mark them uh, in situ with a, with a fence. So also we have control of the hatchlings once uh, they're, they're alive and then we collect them and then we release them in, a, in another beach. As I said, these programs could be run by biolog bi biologists and a lot of volunteers will be happy to help as well. Basically, this was a quick review of the stuff that we've been doing here. That's my information and some of the references that you can see about the, the sargassum uh, affecting the beach and nests and, and compact uh, beaches. Thank you. Thank you, Joao. That, that was very informative and uh, I'm sure that people will have a lot of questions for you. If you haven't already typed your questions into the chat, please feel free to do so. Uh, now, Dwayne is our next presenter and he actually shared with me a video so I'll start sharing the video on my end. And if there are any issues of anybody, please feel free to send me a chat. And just bear with me for a second here so I can play the video that Dwayne shared, which is his presentation. Just one second. Hello and good morning everyone. Uh, thank you to the organizers and attendees for allowing me to share this morning. Uh, my name is Dwayne Benish and I'm the division manager at Elastech. Um, Elastech since 1967 has been manufacturing floating barriers for oil spills and oil spill response uh, such as the Gulf of Mexico spill, uh, floating silt curtains for containment of sediment around construction sites so it doesn't pollute the rest of the waterway, um, trash and debris containment, uh, and floating barriers to keep plastics from going out into the ocean. Uh, that's a big focus for Elastec right now. And then also since 2012, uh, these seaweed control barriers or seaweed control curtains. Um, back in 2012 uh, was the first time I was contacted by a resort off of Antigua that had their entire bay filling up with seaweed. And I hadn't heard of this event before. Uh, but started to receive many calls for the same application. It wasn't until I made a journey to the Dominican Republic that I realized just how bad the situation was. I visited the largest marina in the Caribbean, it's called Marina Capcana, and saw their three crescent-shaped beaches and most of the coastline covered in piles of seaweed. Uh, there were multi-million dollar yachts that were just encased in the seaweed. So my initial thoughts were to recommend our standard open ocean oil spill containment boom, uh, just like we use in the deep water horizon spill. And uh, that thought was, was uh, immediately wrong when I just walked uh, a mile down the beach and I found that exact boom that I was referring to uh, floating in the water from one of my competitors. And there was seaweed on the barrier and then also piles of seaweed on the beach. So it, it was ineffective. 
And it wasn't until I watched that barrier for like 15 minutes before I saw what was happening in the, the, the skirt or the draft that hangs down into the water um, was lifting up and letting the seaweed go underneath and then going back down and, and starting to contain again. Uh, so I traveled back to the last tech factory in Cocoa, Florida and started our team working on developing the Beach Bouncer line of seaweed barrier products. Before we get into what the Beach Bouncer is, I'd like to discuss why a floating barrier makes sense uh, instead of or in conjunction with the beach cleaning. Now, the items you see listed here, we've talked about numerous times. Everybody's aware that you can't swim on beaches that have the, the seaweed. It's like swimming in a mud or a muck and you've got the, the rotten egg smell. You've got the bugs and the, the birds that eat the bugs that are on the decaying seaweed. You've got the cleanup noise of the heavy equipment. And when you go to remove this off the beach, the, the seaweed is, is great for retaining the beach uh, because it, it, you know, in small amounts, because it holds the, the, the sand. But when you then remove that seaweed and it's got all the sand in it, um, you're taking the sand off the beach and there's replenishment costs there. And speaking of costs, uh, you've to remove the weed we we heard in the webinar last friday that the estimate is five million dollars to clean 15 miles of florida beaches plus another million in, in maintenance and upkeep or purchasing new equipment each year uh, and then in last year's discussion uh, on the same format about seaweed, we heard about, I don't know if it was E. coli, but you know, there's, when you till that seaweed under, um, there, there's potential health risks from, from turning that into the sand, uh, because of, uh, you know, so, some sort of, uh, bacteria there. And, and again, maybe we'll hear more on that today, but, um, I, at Elastec, we feel like let's just keep this seaweed out in the water. Uh, once it's out in the water, it's not dying. Um, so, so you don't have the smell. Um, it, it hits our barrier like a rock wall and just keeps on moving. It's not a net. It doesn't trap it and let it die there. It hits it and it moves on. So maybe it can be used in conjunction with beach cleaning. Instead of cleaning up every beach, maybe we direct it using these barriers to a beach that's out of the way or a, a cleanup area. Um, and, and I think funneling it to a certain area makes it easier to clean up. You're losing less sand. Um, and, uh, you know, it, I think it helps the resort guests. So I'd like to talk about what, what doesn't work as far as barriers, uh, what's been used, what's been tried, why they don't work. Uh, silt curtains or turbidity curtains as they're called, uh, are used for short duration around construction sites. And that's what you see in the top two photographs here. Um, there's work being done, the sediment's being contained, uh, but these are, these are built in a, in a way that they're, because they're disposed of typically after the job is done, they're only made to last for the project, for whatever the duration of the project is. And in most cases, they're solid or they're in so fine of a filter cloth that to hold back sediment yet, yet let water pass through that they're ineffective for seaweed. The seaweed will just lift these solid skirts up or these, these really tight mesh skirts and let all the seaweed underneath. And then, as I mentioned before, they'll get it back down and start looking like they're containing again. Um, but, but really it's, it's just the loading is building up on it and then, and then the skirt gets lifted and they go underneath the barrier and then you've got the seaweed on your beach. Um, oil booms, very similar, but oil booms are used for surface containment. They really don't have any draft down into the water. Now, the way that this weed works, the deepest that I've ever seen it um, is 24 inches uh, in depth. Even when it piles up on a barrier or sits on a rock wall, um, if it's in the water, it, it's, it's buoyant enough that it never gets deeper than 24 inches. So when you have an oil boom that has a 12 inch skirt or it has even a, um, you know, an 18 or 24 inch skirt, this, this seaweed can build up on the barrier and then migrate underneath. 
So those are ineffective, and those are some of the photos you see uh, you see there where you can see the, the seaweed going underneath. Um, net booms. Net booms have failed for this seaweed, uh, and, and we use these net booms. We manufacture them for jellyfish. Uh, over in the Middle East and and they're great for jellyfish. They keep the jellyfish from migrating into uh, areas you don't want them such as intakes. Uh, but for the seaweed, the seaweed gets trapped in there and then it dies. And then the weight of the seaweed cause, causes it to, to tear from the flotation. Uh, so net booms that trap uh, the seaweed and could also trap marine life uh, because of their large opening size uh, are not recommended and, and have failed. We've learned quite a bit over the years. Since 2012, we've gone through many iterations of our Beach Bouncer product uh, to fine tune it to make sure that it works uh, as best as it possibly can for the conditions that it's in. Um, you can notice all these different places where we've had installations. Uh, each one has has been challenging in its own right from an anchoring standpoint to um, what type of skirt we should use that's going to not trap anything but also let enough water through and hold back the seaweed so it doesn't migrate underneath. Uh, we came up with three unique systems, the Beach Bouncer, the Beach Bouncer XT, and our new Beach Bouncer M, which is a, a mesh. Elastex original beach bouncer uh, is the most widely used. Um, it has 13 inches above the water and then a three foot skirt down into the water. Again, because of the 24 inch uh, depth that this uh, weed can, can have sitting on the barrier, uh, we've, we believe that a three foot depth skirt is the way to go. And then also the eighth inch mesh uh, we found to be the best mesh to use that is tight enough that it won't trap anything. It, it doesn't grab any particles of this seaweed and hold on to it, nor would it do that with marine life. Uh, but it does allow enough flow through so that the skirt does not billow and let the seaweed underneath. And that is due partly because of the half inch ballast chain we've got running all along the bottom to help keep that skirt uh, down in the water. And uh, the 25 foot anchoring is is very key we have we've gone through a number of installations anchoring from 100 feet down to 50 feet down to 25 feet and have found that that is the sweet spot for holding these curtains in place um, and being able to to ride some of the wave conditions that are out there the beach bouncer xt has a very large 24 inch float above the water uh, so no, no seaweed is coming over the top of this barrier. Um, it has a 60,000 pound brake strength and we designed this, this flotation to hold back a field of logs um, in front of dams and, and trash and debris. But we found that if we hang our eighth inch mesh uh, skirt, skirting underneath this, we've got a very durable uh, seaweed barrier. And uh, you can see some pictures here of it in the water as well as in our test tank. Our newest product in the lineup is the Beach Bouncer M, which we call it M for the mesh because the mesh goes from the very top all the way to the bottom ballast chain. We still have the same three feet of depth uh, down to the bottom ballast chain. We've got 12 inches of freeboard above the water. Uh, but what is unique about this is the mesh uh, you'll have water passing through the mesh at the surface as well as all the way down to the bottom ballast chain. And the reason for that is to reduce the loading, make it lighter, make it easier for it to ride the waves in more challenging situations. Um, but um, the, the, what's under the water is exactly the same with the half inch ballast and the, and the 25 foot anchor points, which again, very important that you anchor it that frequently. These are just graphic depictions or drawings of what each of the three beach bouncers look like. Each install location provides its own challenges. In order to recommend a system, we need to think about 
What is the wind speed? Where's, where's the prevailing winds coming from? What's the flow rate? What's the wave height that we can anticipate? And we don't ever want to put a barrier in breaking waves. We want to try and keep it outside of the breaking waves. Breaking waves are not good for any barrier. Um, we need to think about where the barrier uh, is going to be placed and where's it going to direct the weed? Um, where's it going to go? Um, if anchored properly, it's not going to sit on the barrier. It's going to continue to move with the flow of the current uh, and drop off the barrier somewhere. What beach is that? Is that where we're going to clean it up from? Um, how are we going to anchor this and, and by what means? Are we going to use concrete block? Are we going to use uh, anchors that, that dig into the soil? Are there coral present, uh, which, which pose an issue to both the anchor roads uh, as well as we don't want to damage the coral. So there's a lot to think about when thinking about the materials used and, and the location. Um, and Elastec can be contacted to assist with any of that. Uh, my name is Dwayne Benish, and I really appreciate your time. And you can reach me at this email address. Thank you so much for your time. Okay. That was uh, Dwayne's presentation. So now let's uh, jump into the questions and answers. Uh, by the way, I know that we mentioned it before in the agenda and a few times. We are keeping the meeting open a little bit longer uh, after 12 so that we can continue the conversation. But we have a lot of questions that already came in. So I'm just going to jump straight into these. So for other presenters, please keep a lookout for your names because I will start calling your name. And, uh, and we'll try and get through these as quickly as we can to have uh, several of these questions answered by the group. So the first one for Dr. Serafi, how does sargassum management affect terrestrial in invertebrates? Dr. Serafi, there's, Hi, there's, there's, there's some literature, particularly out of California on this general topic. And, and you know, it's what you might imagine, uh, which is that some amounts of, of, of uh, vegetation accumulating on, accumulating on the beach is, is part of a natural process and many species have evolved to cope with it. Um, the, the huge amounts of sargassum obviously are overwhelming the, the, the systems. But when it comes to management of beaches, it's clear to, to most people that we should be leaving some on the beach. We need to perhaps educate people uh, that uh, it's part of a natural process and that actually it, it helps, uh, some helps uh, 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 maintenance of the beach uh, and, and maintenance of the ecosystem. Um, so, so um, I think, you know, with the exception of when there are these huge sargassum inundations, um, uh, there should be uh, uh, some effort to inform the public that uh, it's not a bad thing. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Here's another question. This one's for everybody. And I know that the government uh, officials that were here last time were very eager uh, to maybe ask this question and we didn't really get uh, to talk about it too much. So, um, Lydia, why don't we start with you? Uh, various universities, technology, and solutions providers. Excuse me, Emilio, you were breaking or me. Can you repeat very briefly the question, please? Yes. Can you hear me better now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So let me try pulling this up again. How can we improve the collaboration between cities and counties in South Florida and the various universities, technology and solutions providers? Well, this is the biggest questions that we have been trying to answer since uh, 2011, I guess, at the international and local level. But I think, first of all, what you guys are doing is amazing. I think this is going to be before and after these uh, two webinars from last year and the one from Friday and today. I think that uh, creating a, the listserv or using Sargnet if you want or creating the one you want thinking in local, we need to have a platform in which we have a mapping of what is doing who, who is doing what. That is going to be very, very important, a mapping of that. Uh, we were thinking also in the development of certain protocols. 
and having this website, a collaborative interacting place where you can have discussions of what are the projects that you are developing. Because there is going to be, I already would love to, to work with Josefina in terms of the different forms and the fractal dimension of sarcasm in terms of what she's doing. So the more we know, I think the biggest challenge is the disconnection of knowing what the other is doing. The second is trying to bring together our expertise and avoid duplication so we can get stronger proposals to uh, agencies to provide money. I Great. think one is trying to have some lessons learned in terms of management that they, they have been doing a lot of work in the Caribbean as well in Texas. We forget that Texas was invaded by sargassum in 2015. And that is another question for oceanographers, what is happening with the Gulf of Mexico? Learning the, how to produce dunes, uh, you know, it, it's an amazing work that they did. So I think uh, to keep it short, is that a platform with information and keeping these webinars and some of them making uh, workshops that could be fantastic. And, and you, Great. you are already doing with the steps. Great, thank you, uh, Dr. Lascoaga. Um, uh, would you like to uh, share have to add, No, just to add to what Ligia said, um, I, don't, I don't see that much difficult with, within the interdisciplinary people working in science, but sometimes within sectors, it is more difficult. So for me, for the group, actually not for me, for the group I am working with, uh, this year we have the the opportunity to 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 get in touch with people of, of government in South Florida because of a proposal that we were writing, and I think that was amazing because we didn't know what they were doing, and I think it's a it's a great opportunity to keep this collaboration. Hopefully, we will have the proposal, but it uh, it, it was a great opportunity to learn more and actually last week was uh, all, all, all the information was in the webinar as well. Great, thank you. And now quickly for the side of the technology and the solutions, Joel, would you like to give some quick thoughts based off of your experience and then after you, Dwayne? Well, yeah, um, as I was saying in my presentation, uh, we do recommend to extract the sargassum when it's still floating, when it's still in the water before it start decomposing, right? So for this, in well, me working at DESME, we have um, improved some technology, some skimmers. Uh, everything basically is, is based or is coming from the uh, oil spill um, situations because they have more experience over the years. And they actually thought that uh, it might, it might uh, develop uh, similar to the, to the uh, oil spills. However, it is different, no? So, we need to specialize on that. So uh, technology has been uh, developing uh, for having uh, the proper tools to actually get the sargassum before reaching the beach. And okay. uh, yeah. So, so in terms of how would you say we can improve the collaboration between the local government agencies in South Florida and some different companies that might offer solutions? Well, well this is the thing, right? So. Uh, we are we are open to offer these solutions and um, I don't know exactly what is the regulation in Florida, uh, but we can we can I don't know we, we can have some chats and we can have some meetings and try to arrange according to the to the alignments that you have over there uh, in order to offer uh, the best solutions. Great, great. Dwayne, on your end, uh, based off of the different interactions you have had with uh, trying to implement these barriers elsewhere, what would you say might be a way to help improve the collaborations? Uh, in South Florida. Yeah, so I will start by saying that there are barriers uh, um, in locations in Florida um, that, um, you know, homeowners have put them in, different resorts have put them in. Um, there wasn't, to my knowledge, DEP or DOT uh, involvement, but we are in conversations with uh, the DEP, Florida DEP and Florida DOT uh, currently, uh, should the install of barriers become more widespread, um, you know what what those regulations are what what for instance what depth of water does it have to be in um you know how does it have to be anchored what is what is the sensitivity to the different types of anchors uh so we're currently talking with dep and dot about that currently uh for uh possible widespread barrier usage for sargasm in florida great great thank you so this is uh for dr lascoaga and also dr Pinanes. 
Um, here's a, a start off with the, the broader uh, statement before the question. So um, at the UK National Oceanography Center, we are thinking to develop a multi in the United States. You are breaking, but I think I heard they are organizing a, a big proposal in the UK. And what was the final? Sorry. The, is there something similar in the United States? Um, not that I am uh, aware. Uh, I, I don't know there is any call that uh, specifically for sargassum, if that is the question. I don't know if any other, anyone knows, but I, no, I am not aware of any specific call for sargassum, no. Okay, anybody else from the presenters know of any uh, large grant opportunities? Okay, so uh, here's a question for Dr. Serafi. Can these amph amphipods provide um, that ecosystem type of service of reducing sargassum biomass at the beaches and to what extent? Well, they already are at, at, at natural beaches. Um, this is pretty anecdotal, but what we've noticed at Key Biscayne Beach is because you have a, you have a natural system right next door to an area that's, that's groomed, is that there isn't uh, development of an amphipod community that gets disturbed uh, by, the, by the raking and grooming. Um, and so um, the, the, the amphipods uh, uh, have to be at a certain density uh, in order for them to remove a given amount of, of, uh, of material. Okay, good to know, good to know. So here is a question for uh, Dr. Elena Solo-Gabriel. What are the effects of mixing sargassum with the sand? Okay, Emilia, you broke up a little bit. Um, the first part I caught was what are the effects of mixing the sargassum? Yes, and the second one is how will this be affecting sea turtles? Uh, what we've been observing is that at the beach, the mixing, there is a certain level at which the mixing can be tolerated um, before you get very high levels of bacteria. Um, and so we do think that some mixing may be fine, but once you get overwhelming amounts of seaweed, um, that something else may need to be done with it. So I do think that there is a threshold in terms of the amount of seaweed that can be assimilated by the shoreline. Um, in terms of uh, sea turtles, um, I don't know. Uh, I do know that there are sea turtle nests where we sample. Um, and so I don't know what the impact is in terms of their ability to dig through the integrated seaweed or if they go up above. Um, I've been generally seeing the sea turtle nests uh, in the non-integrated areas. They tend to go around them. So um, I don't know if uh, it, it interferes with their ability to nest. Okay, thank you for that. So here's another question that's for all, all of the presenters. Um, uh, Ligia, maybe we can start off with you, then we'll go to Josefina. So what are the environmental impacts of today's management practices? Ligia, you might be muted. Yeah, uh, I think we still need to do much more uh, studies to actually provide numbers to back our anecdotal uh, perspective. I have been, you know, in the beaches several times and just by looking at them, it's a lot of impact. I think that the, the major impact is when you are going to be mixing the sand with the seaweed and then putting weight and flattening all of that, you are creating a devastating impact in terms of you're accumulating in the edge, you're creating like a border of the composition, the composition creating a huge sargassum brown tide towards the, the ocean. There is going to be with the rains and everything, all of the leakages are going to go again to the ocean. So it's like putting the garbage below the carpet. And we yes, don't know still what is going to be. That, that from my perspective, I still do not have the data though, but I think we have enough data with the bacteria from Helena's team and other things that people are doing as well. Uh, 
that doesn't mean that we cannot do anything with what is landing in the beach. I think there's a lot of alternatives we need to think out of the box. It's not only stopping, but whatever is arriving, we have serious problems of erosion. Mm -hmm. That's be an alternative to support the creation of dunes. And that could be uh, much cheaper than many management histories, like helping, you know, bring plants, uh, dune plants. But I think there is a lot of, uh, just looking in Crandon, areas where there is no management, they are cleaning up faster than the areas that are being managed. We need oh, okay. to know if the accumulation is hi um, higher in those areas. But that is a, a very short answer for something that we need still to uh, go deeper in our research. Okay, uh, Dr. Lascoaga. I mean, I don't have anything to add to that. So, uh, I mean, more studies are needed. That's what I'm, the only thing I need to say. Okay, uh, Dr. Solo Gabriel, since you have been analyzing data uh, specifically as it relates to this and locally, uh, what would you say are the environmental impacts of today's management practices? Uh, what we believe is happening, and it depends on the tide, and it depends on the environmental weather conditions, um, that uh, when it gets to a point where the bacteria levels are excessive, those bacteria, again, uh, if it's high tide, may get washed back in. Uh, during low tide, maybe not. During wind conditions, they get washed in. Um, so what we believe is happening is that we're getting these periodic pulses of bacteria going back into the water, which then cause the beach advisories. Okay, thank you for that. So we are uh, running short on the time here and we will keep this open for additional uh, conversations and interactions. So I do have uh, another question here that's for everyone and I'll go through the list of each uh, presenter to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to, uh, to answer this. So uh, we're going to start off with uh, Dr. Vignanis and the question is, what are your recommendations on the use or removal of significant accumulations of sargassum on our beaches and coasts in South Florida? Well, uh, this is far from my <laughs> area of expertise, so I really don't have a recommendation regarding the, that, that issue. Sorry for responding that. It's totally fine. Dr. Lascoaga? Well, it's, it's the same thing. I'm not a, it's not my area of expertise, but uh, what I have been hearing is that it's better to keep it in the water. Or, and so the only thing I can say is from our point of view, from the physical oceanographer point of view, but we can provide with the uh, probability of getting in the different places. So if that is something that can help to... Okay, so I can... Following I can up on that, Dr. Lascoaga, what is it that your team... Uh, needs uh, in order to help uh, move along uh, your research on that front. You, you are getting cut, but basically, I th basically what I mentioned in my talk, uh, working with uh, uh, the currents and wind, and using the remote sensing for uh, for initial conditions. But the ultimate goal is to have a probabilistic uh, model uh, of landing, so to help. Uh, end users uh, in cleaning, like a uh, planning where to clean or what to do. Okay, great, great. So the next, uh, for the next presenter, um, Elena and, uh, and Afifa, what would you say your recommendations on the user removal of significant accumulations of sargassum on our beaches in South Florida? Can you repeat the last part you, that you said again? Uh, what are your recommendations on the use and or removal of significant accumulations of sargassum on our beaches and coasts in South Florida? Um, you know, that's a question that will require a lot of um, input from different disciplines. Um, it's not only the bacteria, but then there's the ecosystem issues that have been discussed uh, for, by, for example, Dr. Serafe, uh, the impacts of turtles. Um, and, and so it will require, I think, a consortium of people from different areas to really understand uh, at what point, what, are the man what should be done. Um, and it, my, my impression is that what's been done in the past was okay, I would presume, uh, where it was left or integrated. But I do believe, given the diagram that you've shown of the amount of sargasm and its increase in, increases over time, that whatever we did in the past may not be suitable for the future because of the amounts that are now coming in. 
And so what I would recommend is a group of people, um, committee come together of scientists and practitioners and uh, develop some consensus on how to manage the increases. Thank you for that. And it sounds like we're hearing that more and more, right? That we need more collaboration and, um, and communication between the universities and the, the government officials. So the same question um, to Dr. Serafi, would you like to uh, take a stab at that? Dr. Serafi? Uh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't have an answer. Um, a lot more observations need to be collected from the field and some experiments. Um, uh, and the arsenic question really needs to be addressed. I think it's probably at the forefront. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, obviously this is a huge problem and it's going to take a huge effort to, uh, to fully understand. Okay, thank you for that. Dr. Collado Vides. Um, something that we have been learning through the years since 2011, and we haven't, because this is a complex situation that requires simple solutions. <laughs> and uh, I think creating, I completely agree with Elena about creating a task force. And we have been talking about this at the international level and different levels. So I know that NOAA is producing and is going to be launching next month or at the end of the month the Sargassum Hub, a website. So trying to join efforts, but having a task force that is going to be addressing this is going to be very important. And if we could have experts that know how to deal with complex situations, uh, I know MIT has a great lab about uh, addressing complex situation in linking humans and artificial intelligence. So a task force is, is, is something that is mandatory. To, to have, and we could start at the local level, let's say, you know, South Florida, uh, and also keep the connection with the international expertise that is happening. The level of seminars between Africa and the Caribbean is just amazing what the United Nations are doing. There is a lot of work by different instances in terms of forecasting. The French government is pouring a lot of money and so there is a, a, advances and we need to start having those collaborations. So thank you. Th thank, thank you for you. that. So now um, for uh, Joel Gonzalez, would you like to uh, ask a question? Yeah, uh, adding to this information and uh, what uh, Dr. Solo was saying, uh, you need to form the committees and put together the, the scientists uh, along with, uh, with the people that is on the field and with the, with the authorities. This is what we've been doing here uh, already since 2015. So we already have these committees. We are part of these committees and this is how we are been learning all together. Uh, and once again, as I was saying on my, on my presentation, you don't need to start from zero. We are happy to help and you, you can come and, and talk with us and we can share information. And this is, this is uh, all the Caribbean area, right? It's not only the states that is affecting, there is a lot of countries, so, so this is all the Caribbean area, and there is a lot of research and a lot of studies and a lot of projects already have done. Uh, we, we have some uh, pr proofs and errors, right? So, so we're still developing, we're still learning, but we already have like five years of this uh, stuff already done. So we're happy to help. Come, come close to us, to our committees, to our government, and then we can share information. Uh, the, the thing is with the currents that the, the sargasso is, is hitting us first, right? Because it's coming from sort, south to north. So that's why you're getting it right now. But we already have uh, many years, well, five years at least of research and, and tests uh, that we can share. And we, uh, Dwayne was saying the same thing, right? They start like proving with different methods and, and, and different barriers that doesn't really work because they're from old spill. So we need to develop and we need, we need to progress on the, on the technology as well to, to help that. And uh, I see some questions about what to do with the sargassum. Well, that's the other part. We need, we need to integrate to make a circle and, and make a use of this, right? It's very difficult to use because they, they have been said as well about the heavy metals and arsenic. So the, the first thing that comes to mind that is uh, most power, powerful uh, 
tool that we can use uh, Sargasso for is the construction. I think uh, it has a uh, good content of cellulose. So we are looking at construction um, things with the uh, Sargasso. So. Great, great, thank you. So, so again, I guess it's a collaboration and getting collaboration. together, forming official groups and task forces and things of that nature. So before we get to uh, Dr. Las Coagas closing remarks, Dwayne, um, the same question for you. No, absolutely. Uh, jo Joel is, is, is so correct in that I don't feel like here in Florida we need to recreate this wheel. Um, there, there's, there's already so much information coming out of the Caribbean, Caribbean internationally. Um, we've got our experiences down there with different installations that we've had, um, a, a, as well as what uh, Joe has in, uh, is, is experiencing in Mexico and, and uh, both, both Desmi and, and Elastec as companies have been developing this technology for barriers and, and, and Desmi with its removal, uh, with its removal apparatus uh, to get the seaweed, um, you know, after it's deflected by the barriers that I think um, as far as any task force that, that is put together, uh, definitely um, we need folks that have the international, uh, like you said, five years or so of experience having to deal with this because really we're new to this game here in Florida. Uh, we, we've gotten small amounts of seaweed in the past, but now we're starting to experience what the Caribbean has for the last five to seven years. Great, thank you for that. Um, so now if, uh, Dr. Olascoaga, would you like to give the closing remarks before we move to the next session, which is very important, is that we are extending this webinar. I uh, just wanted to repeat that again uh, so that we can continue the conversation. Closing remarks. Hi, Emilio, we couldn't hear you, but yeah, uh, can you see me as my screen? Yes. Okay, so yeah, we don't have much more time, but uh, I just want to say, actually many of you mentioned it in the last question, and it was here prepared from with uh, Emilio and Valentina when we were planning this closing. We want to point out what many people have already said, that we want to take into account the multi-sector and multidisciplinary need to collaboration, right? I, I, we listed there a few of them. And the other thing that I want to say is that to form these groups, uh, we are planning to send a, a post webinar uh, survey. So please stay tuned, answer it. And part of the questions that we were planning was about forming a task force for South Florida and have an, a more dedicated listserv. This is not trying to, um, we know there is a SARFnet and other efforts. Of course, we know that and we, we want to learn from them, but we want to also have something more specific for the, for the local to be focused on the local problem. So it's not a repetition. So, uh, I mean, I, I am all participating in the international one too, but I, we want to have something more uh, local. So there is two things, a, a, an email list if you want to get information from this group and answer please the survey for, for uh, for future uh, form of a task, serve, a task force, sorry. And as we said at the beginning, we know many of you have to go, but others are, uh, were asking to have a, a more open conversation between the participants and not just the, the speakers. So if you wanna stay uh, for a little longer, we will keep the, the forum open for, for everybody. Um, and that's it, uh, thank you for being here today and this is already a tradition so we hope to see you next summer on the same webinars hello uh, jose i think that we need to still tune this this uh, uh summer i don't think yeah. that bye joel i don't okay, think well. that uh and thank you very much joel because you bring part of mexico here please stay longer because uh, we have six uh we have six pages of questions we know that we didn't answer all of them. Unfortunately, there were not enough time. Uh, so that's why we extended the time for uh, the people that can stay longer. Um, we know that there is so much things that we have to be talking in this, uh, in this forum. Uh, Emilio, Josefina and I, we have been done an extra effort to, um, to, to uh, 
to produce these uh, webinars and I think that we are going to, to keep uh, developing and coordinating more of these webinars. Uh, so please stay, stay here. So is there any, anyone in the, in the, uh, the, the chat that wants to start talking and exchanging some ideas? We know that this is a regional problem. We know that has to be an holistic uh, approach. We know that um, that we need to have uh, information and we uh, and collaboration with other countries. So please, people in this uh, in this chat, and actually we have here Dr. Brigitta um, from Mexico. So Brigitta van Tusenborg. So please, do you want to be part of this and then just open your microphone and a camera and a star since you have been working with this issue for so long in the entire Caribbean? Do you want to give some of your uh, remarks, suggestions or anything? And thank you. Welcome here. Sorry, we have to rush all the time. <laughs> I know you're all really very busy. <laughs> thank you very much for the invitation. Very interesting seminar. Uh, yes, it, it just illustrates we're all dealing with the same problems and it just illustrates we all have to learn from each other. And um, I think it also, what, what I really notice um, with the US, um, what's happening now, they're mainly concentrating on the beach. And um, my message really is it's not only the beach, it's the whole ecosystem which is affected by the, by the massive influxes of sargassum. Um, because of the huge quantities of nutrients which are being put into the system, because of the organic material which is put into the system and other lixiviates amongst other uh, metals. So it, it really, and then it has a lot of consequences, trophic consequences, more diseases, um, changes in communities, etc. So in the end, our ecosystem services will, will, will suffer. And that will, and I think we really are not sufficiently aware of those consequences, which go really very fast, but which are just beyond the beach. So I, I would really like to stress that it's just more than the beach alone. That's how I would start um, um, this this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brigitta. Actually, being uh, an oceanographer and being part of the Clivar cruises that are, we are uh, measuring chemical and physical parameters around the world. So is it really important to start um, collaborating all the countries in order to go directly to the source, to the equator, investigate what are the, the, the physical and the chemical parameters? How does the current probably has been changing? They're not the currents, but the water masses has been changing there, what is really producing the, 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 the bloom, not only, not only the, um, the discharge from the, from, from the Amazon River, if not, there are other things that are changing because the poles are uh, melting and everything changes there, changes all the different water masses. So this is very important that we start investigating the source. And as you mentioned, um, so it's important to keep the sargassum offshore. We have to study outside, but as the point of view of chemical of oceanographer and knowing that most of the carbon are storage in the deep ocean, in the, in the, 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 the so it's important. Probably is the, the own, their own way that our planet is telling us, you know, we need to start mitigating climate change. We need something. So probably the plants as, as trees, you know, and, and uh, sargassum needs to be, you know, blooming again in order to absorb all this extra CO2. This is something that is going to be kind of, you know, we need both uh, scientific approach, uh, but also trying to understand the entire planet from other perspectives, not only scientific, right? What do you think, Brigitta? I completely agree. Sargassum is a response, but um, a multifaceted response. So it's not only the, the nutrients, it's climate, global climate change, it's increasing um, Sahara dust, it's in bed, um, river catchment management, um, and all, all, everything else. So it, there, there's not one single uh, entity or country or anything to blame. It's, it's general. So that's why 
uh, I consider it's, it's really important to understand more. We also, therefore, we also need to know more about the species itself, themselves, but we need to know more about, um, but I think it also says that at this point, trying to deal with a problem from its source is very difficult. It both basically deals, we have to learn how to, uh, how to live with it. How to live with the sargassum. Sargassum, I agree, it's a response to us uh, messing, messing with, with a lot of, well, um, increasing nutrient input, changing ocean currents, changing wind regimes, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that, that's most likely the cause. But it's, it's so multifaceted that we really won't be able to go to the source and, and get done with it. So the message is most likely sargassum is here to stay and we have to learn how to deal with it. And I think that those are really very, very good points. If, if we take that as a, as a starting point, then, then we can have some really good management, pro management programs. And then we have how to best do it, for example. So that for me, that, that's the way to go for it. Do you know if there is any entity uh, that is trying to uh, develop management plan? I know that management plan has to be uh, for each uh, country or probably for each regions because it changes. But do you know any entity that is uh, comparing plans or exchanging ideas? Or maybe, you know, actually we should create a forum for all the different entities from different countries in order to exchange the, the ideas of management plan. But you have been participating in international conferences. So is there anything that you can tell us about it? At the moment, there's not. There, there's a, I think there's quite a lot of communication. Sargnet, what Ligia was saying, is, is a really great help. I think there, there are quite a lot of um, scientists and some management managers just communicating with each other how to best go for But basically, it's now everybody protects their own beach. And that's all. And as, I, and as I'm really trying to say, we have to think beyond that if we really want to do with it pro properly. And if, if we can just accept, okay, you can't attack it at a source, you can't blame any time or anything or any country in particular, and we have to deal with it, well, then, then, then we can go ahead. Then we can go ahead and, and try to um, go, um, go about this in a more international manner. And I think there are some management um, principles which have been set up, which really are okay, which um, I think, as I said, the, it's been already, I think, in 2012, I think, or 2000, no, I think in 2015, it was already a meeting where they said, well, we really should try to retain sargassum um, before it reaches the beaches. And I think that's, that's a really good rule. So how um, everybody goes um, about it, how to do it, I think that really depends on the local country. But I, I, I think that at least having this basic principle you can go ahead. And I think there are a lot more um, we, we can establish. And then uh, it's not only mitigating sargassum. In the end, we also have to restore ecosystems which were damaged. So it's, it's an enormous task ahead of us. Exactly, exactly. So that we have to collaborate. Is there anyone from the public so that wants to interact, just open your, uh, your camera, your microphone, and we can see, I can see them on top of my screen and then you can start speaking. Pablo, okay, Pablo, yeah. welcome to the webinar. And I know that you, because you wrote, wrote me before, Pablo uh, has a, some, some ideas, in an, is an entrepreneur and an ocean uh, engineer. Yes, I'm an ocean engineer and I've been around the water all my life. And uh, I was in Mexico last year when I uh, found out about the situation that was occurring there concerning the accumulation of sargasso and turtles that were being killed because they could not get in the water once they hatched. So I've been working, I retired last year and I've been working for the past year harder than ever. Uh, I've come up with a solution I think that will be uh, very, very helpful. And uh, it's based on protecting life. So it's not just simply about extracting sargasso, but it's about extracting sargasso in a very, very, very uh, marine ecologically uh, you know, uh, manner. So there's very, very, uh, you know, very little damage, if any damage at all to marine life, basically turtles and so forth. So um, 
I think barriers and uh, you know extraction vessels are are basically uh, they go hand in hand, and uh, if we address the problem properly here in the United States, I think we can really really uh, do a tremendous effort to try to control it, and uh, it will be very cost effective. You know when you when you look at what's happening right now and the way that the problem is being treated. Uh, once it gets on the beach, the damage is done. So um, I know that there's a law passed in 2014 concerning uh, lower head turtles, but times have changed and uh, turtles are being killed by the invasion. So I think we need to rethink our methods and uh, possibly come up with new solutions. Yes, and then you have part of your solution about uh, that your invention or your design about a uh, research vessel, right? In order to collect some yes. sargasso. I have some naval architecture training in addition to engineering, and I've designed a vessel that's patent pending that will be very efficient. It's basically, basically, basically it was designed to uh, operate it at sea, not in lakes or rivers, like most of the other vessels that are out there. I was planning to take it myself from Key West to Mexico uh, to uh, demonstrate its ocean capabilities. And it's also fast. And it's been designed, uh, there's features there that, are, that have been incorporated in the design, so to minimize any damage to marine life. So it's, it's quite unique. Okay, okay, thank you very much, Pablo. Someone else from the public, I know we, we receive a lot of yes. questions about products. <clears throat> yes, good morning. My name is Ingo Fivek, I hope you can hear me. I am the representative of Desme here in Florida and parts of the Caribbean and Latin America. And I've been in contact, with, uh, I live here in Key Biscayne and uh, the town, uh, I've made them a presentation on our system. And we have, uh, as uh, Noel already, Joel has already uh, mentioned, we have developed the last five years the complete solution to this system. So a lot of the problems that are being faced nowadays will be done away with when our system is implemented. And what I suggest to do is that we present in the next meeting our videos and, and we can explain our system and uh, I think that uh, in order to validate that here we should make an installation in Key Biscayne uh, maybe also one in Miami Beach so it can be validated under different conditions and you can then monitor the scientific part I very much believe in that I've been um, all my life working in tandem not only as a sales director but also uh, very much uh, together with research institutes and other disciplines that uh, in the beer and beverage and food industry that is also, of course, in very delicate environments where, <clears throat> uh, you know, research institutes uh, in Europe and the United States have worked with us to validate what our technologies do. And so um, this is a, uh, a concerted effort and uh, I really am very happy that this uh, group has been formed because when I visited various stations in the US uh, here and in Florida, I noticed there was no communication. And so of course that made it very difficult to align everybody. So the alignment of everybody needs to be done and uh, you know certain protocols have to be observed and certain uh, you know targets and uh, improvements have to be defined and and met and, and controlled and monitored so um i live here in miami and in Key Biscayne, so i can go to all these places very easily and interact with uh, most of you and uh so our, our system is proven. It is based on uh, the simple fact that we uh, believe that the sargassum needs to be removed from the water so it is clean, it clean and clear of sand, and then it can be processed on shore. It, it's pumped on shore by our skimmer, and our mesh boom now is very developed. We've gone through several different models that, of course, come from the oil industry where we are the world's leader. The U.S. Coast Guard is one of our clients here in the United States, so they're very aware of our technologies and our background. So um, we 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 have the credentials to uh, to solve this problem, and it is a, a very proven technology. And so, uh, as you've heard from 
you know, the gentleman from Elastic, this is this is the future, this is the sustainability, this is a different way of looking at it. And, uh, you know, South Florida has a huge tourist industry, and uh, we as humans have to, of course, continue to interact properly with our nature. The turtles are a huge concern to me and to everyone else. And uh, I think we can do a much, much, much better job of protecting them because right now, uh, you know, if you consider <clears throat> that one in a thousand survive, there really is nothing being done for them. So uh, that really needs to be uh, taken care of uh, with uh, a different way of doing it. Um, you know, you can separate the, the turtles and take them out to the ocean. This is the way we do it partially in Mexico. So we have plenty of uh, experience to validate what we're doing. And uh, we, we have to change. We have to adapt to this new phenomenon. And uh, it's not going to go away because the eutrophication and the uh, effects uh, of, of, of food going in, in various forms into the ocean is multiplying this phenomenon. The sand from the Sahara is blowing out into the ocean. It's feeding the sargassum. Uh, it's a phenomenon that we're, we have to deal with. We have to live with it just like we have to live with the COVID. So, I mean, these, these are phenomenons of our modern age. And our sustainability of our ecosystem is, um, you know, jeopardized if we don't do something about it. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Joel is going to be uh, talking probably about the air curtain barriers, barriers, because we have yes. some questions. And Joel is, uh, is is has to go, so Joel, could you please tell more about the air curtains? That is also another issue here in. Uh, in South Florida because of, of the canals and maybe other places in the Caribbean? Joel? Mm, Joel? Looks like he's gone. <laughs> oh, okay, because he, he, he wrote me about that. Okay, anyway, so Dwayne, are you here? Do you I have am. anything, any question? Do you know anything about air curtains? Uh, only a little bit. Um, the air curtains work in a relatively calm situation um, and, and can prevent seaweed from, from uh, migrating into canals, uh, such as in, uh, the Florida Keys. Um, and uh, it, it really does need to be calm, though, because the air bubbles have to float to the surface and create a, you know, a barrier there. Um, so it doesn't work in, in a lot of different situations. But, but it can work in a relatively calm situation. Um, the only drawback is I believe the air compressor has to be running full time. So you need to have power at your dock or in your canal in order to run that. But uh, I, I'm, I'm not an expert by any means. Um, it's one of the uh, questions we get asked as a barrier provider. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dwayne. And actually, yes, probably it's not one of the best options if they are going to be consuming electricity and electricity is going to produce more CO2. So we will have, you know, we, we are not really eradicating the, the, the problem. So is there yeah. any, inter yeah. thank you very much, Dwayne. Is there any entrepreneur that wants to talk about products from, uh, uh, that has been developed with Sargassum? I know that there are people from the biodiesel um, industry and other industries. Is there anyone that wants to talk? Participants, please. I I, I have seen when in, my, in one of my visits in Mexico um, some of the uses. First of all, I've seen incinerators, all right, so that you can generate energy. You can, uh, for example, heat water. Uh, you know, hot water can be used for many, many different uses, as we well know. So that's one thing that can be done with the sargassum. The other one is uh, it can be used some for colorants. It can also be used, I have seen some uh, plastic utensils uh, like forks and plates that have been done in Mexico, uh, construction bricks. And I also represent uh, one of the world's largest plastic companies. And so we're very closely looking at what we can do with the sargassum to mix it in, to re use it in, in recycled plastic. So we could have a double whammy effect if we could be effective with the using the, the sargassum. And, uh, and, and the last one is some uh, we have some medicine um, pharmaceutical companies that are interested in the sargassum because there are some substances in it that can be used for medicinal purposes. So all, I, I'm a member of this work group in Mexico. So. <clears throat> 
we can uh, maybe uh, fathom out how we can uh, share some of this information with you. But yes. On a, what's, on a your, box, what's your name? Uh, Do you have your camera? My name is. Name? My name is Ingo Fibic. Ingo, okay. Are you here? I'm on the so phone right now. Are you on the phone? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm on the phone. So, uh, but but you 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 will see me maybe in the in 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 the next seminar for for sure. And okay. um, so, I you know I'm I'm a uh, economist. I'm graduated in Germany. I've been working in the food and beverage, and I've been working for 40 years in the oil uh, spill protection industry. So I'm very very aware of uh, barriers and their how they work, how effective they are, and we 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 have an effective system in place now for the sargasso. So it's a complete system together with the recovery system. So so we have a system, a solution for it. So uh, it's definitely uh, the, the the future, you know. And if you look at viability, uh, sustainability aspects of uh, a beach, you know, and now you have all all the data of the contamination, the arsenics and, and, and things, you know, so uh, it's, it's a problem. It's a, it's a problem that needs to be, needs to be done, dealt with in a mm. different way and the mechanical, uh, uh, the effects of also the, the coloring of the water and darkening the color of the water. And, the, you know, uh, as I said, uh, South Florida yeah. is a tourist destination, you know, Miami Beach, you get, you know, you get hundreds of hotels over there. You got you got a huge amount of beach exposure. You look at the west coast of Florida. I mean, it's huge. I understand that the the, the governor of Florida had already designated a sargassum um, a, a work team or, 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 or something like that. Uh, so we, we might need to, to, to look at who who's handling that and coordinate everybody to get everybody in the loop. You know, to be to make sure that everybody has his say and 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 input, and so. Um, but this is uh, this is a this is a big issue now. Yes, and definitely uh, bioplastic is one of the that will be a great a great invention if the people can use some yes. for that. I was yes. in Germany last yes. year, um, yes. and actually I learned in Germany that many years ago, you know, in the in the beginning of 1900s. People were using different kind of uh, seaweed that also arrived at that time uh, in the northern part of uh, of Germany. They were using that Imagine. and, and isolated the, uh, the the houses because you know you have a very bad winter, cold winter. So they use that right. uh, for for isolating and uh, keep it warm the houses. Also, they use Amazing. it for uh, um, as a pillow, you know, to 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 put something in the, <laughs> the pillow. So it's really important. Germany has a great technology. You have a wonderful yes. uh, people, research, actually. There is many of the yes. technologies developed by you know, like research environmental. They are really concerned. Germans are really concerned about the sustainability and make sustainable products. So we yes. want that. So now we have uh, Robert Moser who wants to talk. Robert, so could you turn yes. on your camera and your telephone? And thank you very thank much, you. all of you, for, for participating. Thank you very much. Um, wonderful webinar as well. I recommend everyone to review the previous webinar, which was tremendous as well. For anyone thank who- you. Do you have a camera? You. Do you want to see, show your face? Um, I prefer to show the background <laughs> pictures. Okay. I don't know if you can see my profile picture or my uh, virtual oh. background, but uh, for anyone who's not on video or on the chat, um, we have an area that's over approximately a mile long. We have approximately 50 feet wide by well over 12 inches deep. It's approximately 90 minutes from Miami in Lower Matacumbi Key, and it would be a wonderful research uh, location if anyone is in need of uh, a location to further their research. We found dead sea turtles who possibly couldn't make it back through the sargasm. It was so thick. Um, of course, all different sea life. We have a dune restoration potential area adjacent to us. We have a canal that fills up with sargasm. Um, and we're very interested in uh, dewatering uh, of watering and uh, I don't know, leaching out the salt in order to uh, compost or use the sargasm as fertilizer in different areas that are close by us. So I just wanted to put that out there because we're 
basically a homeowners association that is following the inundation since uh, the 70s. Thank you. And Thank my you email is robert much. at robertmoser.com. Thank you. Put it that on the chat because we are going to record everything. And so then we will have the contacts. Something very important is that uh, FDEP has to be regulating all the places that where sargassum has to be at uh, disposal or maybe, you know, doing the um, uh, fertilizers or compost because it's important, you know, to, to be according to the regulations and because of uh, leaching of different type of elements, not only metals, but another elements. So anyone wants to talk? Who wants to be next? Open your microphone and your camera. Um, Don't be shy. Hi. <laughs> Don't be shy. Hi, Martin. Hi. Uh, um, I just, uh, I'm, I'm fine. I just wanted to uh, say hello to everyone. Uh, I'm actually originally from Florida, although I live in the UK and I have done so for the last 25 years. Um, uh, I am the inventor of a project called Seaweed Paddock, and we were. Um, uh, tasked by ARPA-E, which is part of the Department of Energy, to uh, try to develop a seaweed farm that could reduce the constituent costs of farming macroalgal so they could be cheap enough to be used for liquid biofuels. Um, uh, I targeted sargassum because um, it it is uh, unique in the macroalgal and being fully hollow pelagic its entire life is uh, in the open ocean and uh, also it is uh, unattached uh, so you can get uh, elements of scale that don't exist with uh, rope based farms. Um, it also produces asexually so uh, it, 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 it except by vegetative separation it will continue to grow and so it's, it's, it's actually much easier to farm from that point of view. Um, one of the things that we looked at was whether or not it was possible to economically use the sargassum that was floating around in the open ocean. Um, and there are problems with that because um, you have to establish ownership of, of the sargassum and its critical habitat. Um, it becomes a different issue once it starts to uh, become collected by municipalities and local organizations because then you uh, don't have to go out and collect it yourself. You're sort of taking care of their garbage. Um, but um, as many people have mentioned, um, there are a lot of, uh, uh, there's a high mineral content and metal content in the sargassum. And so that makes it uh, more difficult to, uh, to convert. Um, you can turn it into biodiesel, um, but the, um, uh, um, the, the effluent from this biodiesel is, is very corrosive. Um, there are, uh, it is also possible to, to turn it into methane through, uh, anaerobic digestion. Um, one of the exciting processes that, um, that I've been, uh, sort of pushing with our, with our partners is hydrothermal liquefaction. Um, this this essentially is a relatively fast process that turns sargassum, well, any carbon rich material um, into a sort of a precursor for crude oil. Um, some systems can make it more like a heavy bunker fuel. Um, but there's, uh, there are some technical challenges that need to be overcome. That, that still had to do with the logistics of moving it around um, and scale and reliability. Because if you're producing something for biofuels, you want it to have a relatively regular, stable uh, supply so you, can, um, you don't have a peak in a trough and you don't have to have a lot of storage. You can design it for the right size. Um, uh, yeah, so that's a pretty much a, a, a potted history of, of Sargassum's uh, potential energy use. Okay, so do you, know, do you know if there is any uh, company already producing and using um, not, not only research, because I know that there are research projects trying to uh, produce the biofuel and what you just mentioned, but any company that is already 
using bio, uh, sargassum or other seaweed doesn't have to be sargassum for biofuels around the world? Not at a commercial scale. Um, there, um, I can't remember the name of the company. Um, the, the, the way that, the, way that um, the biofuels have been produced um, at a close to economic uh, level is by, by using co-products. So you use a, a, a part of the fraction of, of the seaweed um, for medical uses. Uh, and then once those chemicals have been extracted, then you send it on to uh, being used for uh, biofuels. But uh, just to get a sense of scale, um, uh, you, the, the food, if you're, if you're using it for food, it's about 10 times the value of using of what it needs to be if you were using it for uh, for a biofuel. So a biofuel source material needs to be a tenth of the price of something that that is uh, 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 being used for food. Um, to be okay. 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 Thank you very much. And I think that uh, you know that we are in a uh, in, a, in the world, in a global economy, but I think that we have to start changing this type of um, uh, economical model, especially because we are seeing that there are problems with climate change and everything. So maybe, you know, just produce by a small, a small uh, producers, not like commercial scale, not global, but local commercial scale, we can uh, use sargassum and another type of uh, uh, natural products that can be uh, changing our economies and being more like a circular economy and not really importing or exporting uh, to other countries, if not just thinking and focusing our, in our own uh, region. Anyone else that wants to be, to participate and express any idea or any questions that hasn't been uh, addressed? We still have in here people from uh, the bacteria uh, field if there is anyone uh, interested in bacteria, I think uh, they left. So anyone else that wants to be next? So please just turn on the camera and uh, show yourself and, and speak. Yes, uh, Valentina, you briefly mentioned yesterday about the possibility of taking nearshore sargasso and moving it offshore. Could you expound on that a little bit, please? Yes, I think, you know, that will be very, very creative. I don't know how, you know, but I'm thinking. So the idea is to keep, for me, as a as, as chemical oceanographer is, and a person that has been working with climate change, the best will be just to keep the sargassum offshore, but far offshore, you know, because the problem that uh, uh, Joel was expressing that happened in Mexico. So we have to be the sargassum has to be mostly in the open ocean in order that really keeps absorbing the, uh, the CO2. And then later when it degrades or dies, so they can go directly to the, to the uh, uh, bottom of the ocean that where is uh, the main storage of, of, um, of uh, CO2 and carbonate uh, parameters there. So it will be very nice if someone uh, will be, you know, like a group, we need to create a group with different expert, expertise in order that we can uh, try not on, you know, not to wear, not only to use vessels, but something that can push the sargassum or bring in especially, you know, probably to the uh, Gulf Stream current. And I don't know what uh, are the impacts causing there. So maybe by the Gulf Stream current is going to enlarge sargassum sea. So it's just an idea, but uh, in order to keep the sargassum out, but it's something that we have to explore from different perspective as a multidisciplinary and uh, multi-sectoral um, uh, uh, approach. Is there anyone else that wants to mention anything that wants to show up, please? Because we have uh, here the forum. So any kind of uh, questions, idea, etc., will be welcome. Valentina, this is Dwayne. Yes, hi, Dwayne. Uh, you mentioned keeping it in the ocean, and, and we, we've heard over the years from a couple of different companies and universities um, that are trying to collect it uh, out at sea, you know, taking boats, large vessels, and, 
and uh, collecting the seaweed and dragging it to another place or hooking up a pump uh, and forcing it downward. So all the, the oxygen vesicles that are on the weed itself to keep it afloat, um, you know, forcing that downward in the, in the ocean. Do you see that as a possible benefit? I mean, it's, it's near impossible if you've ever flown over this in a plane um, and, and see these in, invasion fleets of seaweed mats. It's, it's, it's an impossible needle in a haystack uh, thing to, to harvest this out in the ocean. But um, it, just on the chance that someone could enforce it downward, do you see that as a benefit or, or a drawback? I think that harvest is directly in the open ocean. I don't think that is a good idea because as I'm telling you, because of the absorption of CO2, but because of the problem that is causing on the beaches, so harvesting the sargassum arriving to the beach, probably even if it's since the point of view of uh, uh, the biology, uh, of uh, uh, biological oceanography, there is an, a, a fauna that is associated to this, with this sargassum. So in Mexico, they didn't have any other option that they start, you know, getting the sargassum out. Unfortunately, coel is not here. But for me, being on the beaches and seeing how those the uh, small uh, uh, fish and many other animals are hanging out uh, where the sargassum uh, are floating. So I don't. I think that my concern as a marine scientist is what is happening with all these organisms. And I don't know if Dr. Uh, Seraf is here, that uh, he's uh, um, more in the, uh, uh, the biology field. Dr. Serafi, do you want to mention something about your concerns of harvesting sargassum close to the, to the shore, but in, it's still in the water? Yeah, obviously there, there's, up to hundreds of different species that utilize sargassum as habitat. And so any sort of mechanical uh, device or, or, um, or netting or any other um, uh, way of, of, of moving the stuff uh, is likely to have um, some serious impacts on, on animals that associate with it in, in the ocean. Um, so I think it's been done to some degree, and, and there may even have been permits that were uh, provided for, for uh, you know, several decades ago when people were exploring it. Um, but uh, yeah, removing the animals from, from the stuff um, is, uh, is a serious concern. Yeah, and this is something that has to be a studying and uh, has to be, you know, in order that we can know more, what are the impacts and if, because we have to have, we have to be in the happy medium, right? So we're having the problem and we have to protect the, the residents, we have to protect our ecosystems. So we need to be in the happy medium that is, is kind of difficult. Thank you, Dwayne, and thank you for, for all your, you know, your ideas as an entrepreneur. Yeah, I actually have one more comment and, and something that really wasn't mentioned during all this. And I don't know if Desmi is still, um, you know, on, on, on the line, but, um, you know, in removal of this, there, 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 there is wildlife inherent with the collection of this sargasm. And, and also we're not talking about the trash and the plastics that are out there in the ocean. Um, and, and if you see the seaweed piled up on beaches, there's inevitably bottles and, and cans and, um, uh, you know, different types of, of trash that are discarded that are in the seaweed. And there's a whole other process of having to separate all that uh, and recycle it or, or dispose of it. Um, that, that, is, that is a whole other process if you allow it to come onto the beach, you know, that, that needs to happen in addition to just collecting it and then disposing of it. There's also a separation process. You're, you're true. And you know what, Dwayne? Uh, one of my concerns is, for example, in Key Biscayne, with all the machinery that they are using for integrated sargassum. Um, so they have been breaking glass. And when I have been walking along the beach, I have seen kids with a bucket pick up, picking up all this glass and then just trying to walk along the beach as uh, you know, like just for doing exercise or enjoying the beach. I have to be sorting all these different uh, glass that is really dangerous. I don't know if, uh, 
uh, Dr. Samimi is here from our last webinar, or he left. I think there is no here, it's not here. Dr. Samimi, are you here? No, it's not. So, but this is a, this is a concern and the plastic is a concern. Actually, I was, uh, people were collecting sargassum for, for, for me and my group at, uh, from Rasmus in uh, the different um, uh, gyres where they are, you know, the patches of, of uh, garbage. And they told me that they found, you know, tons of plastic, of course, floating with all this sargassum and act as a trap. So this is also another area of investigation. This is important, also separation, as you said. So there is a lot of things to, to do. So anyone else that wants to be, Amanda, please, I would love to have your participation here. Oh, thanks, Valentina. Um, I just wanted to comment on the inclusion of plastic with sargassum. So not only do we want to concern ourselves with metal concentrations in the sargassum, but plastic is known to preferentially uptake metals from the ocean as it leaches in the sea. So we have two sources of metals that are possibly contaminating the system. Yeah, and also, also not only metals, but also an, or, an organic compounds that are really, we are, you know, the, the, entire, the entire fauna and, and a trophic uh, chain are uh, accumulating and we are eating those and other, you know, uh, the ecosystem is really getting food of toxic elements because of, of our lack of awareness, environmental awareness, and just because of the, of the, of the garbage, it's, it's incredible. Um, eh, Amanda, anything else that you would like to share with us? I wanted to actually introduce Dr. Amanda Ollert. So it's part of our group for trace metal uh, investigation and uh, uh, composition, chemical composition of sargassum. Hi everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction, Valentina, and thank you for sharing all your different perspectives. I just want to agree with everyone who's spoken before. This is an interdisciplinary, inter research, um, industry, governmental effort, and I'm, I'm so glad to hear from all of you and your different perspectives. Um, yeah, Valentina and I are working in the trace metal analysis of the sargassum, and we're um, prepping some samples for analysis to work on quantifying metals and arsenic arriving in the sargassum to the, the Florida beaches. So I'm happy to be um, learning from you all and, and a part of the conversation. And could you please tell us why is it important our research about chemical composition in order that we can, uh, this is one of the top you know, research that we should do locally uh, as well as regionally, compare our data with the regions in other places around the world. But could you explain why is, is the, the importance in order, uh, what is the importance? Because if not, I will answer for you. <laughs> Um, you know, I think there's many different reasons to understand the chemistry. We want to know what is the best way to, to deal with the sargassum. So understanding what it's composed of, we may make different decisions based upon what, what it contains. So if we find um, also high levels of arsenic in the sargassum arriving to Florida, that's something to contend with when you start thinking about safe levels for um, communities to use the sargassum compost as fertilizer and how do we mitigate those types of um, high concentrations that could be detrimental to the environment. So just understanding what it's made from is helpful in terms of how to, how to use it. Um, also understanding the elemental concentrations can help us understand the source. So we can understand uh, perhaps where the sargassum is coming from. We can understand perhaps more about its life cycle. But again, these things are very, um, they need interdisciplinary study. So biologists, ge uh, geochemists, oceanographers, physical oceanographers, we all need to work together to kind of put our different data sets together to answer these big questions because it's, it's very complex. And could you please talk a little bit about our uh, research for nitrogen isotopes? Mm -hmm. What to know about that is really important? Sure, yeah. So um, nitrogen isotopes can help us understand rates of nitrogen fixation. Um, and nitrogen fixation is a Nitrogen fixers are, play a key role in carbon sequestration. So understanding the impacts of sargassum degradation, um, its life cycle, how um, carbon can be stored or released during the transport and growth and development of these different sargassum floats is really linked to um, nutrient availability such as phosphorus and nitrogen and iron. So uh, yeah, nitrogen isotopes can be very important in that respect. 
Yes, so I wanted to share with the public. Thank you very much, Amanda. I wanted to share with all the public. Don't go. Don't go, please. So uh, why we decided to start creating a multidisciplinary uh, group at Rasmus with other people also at FIU and we try to include everybody from NOAA, from all the different uh, institutes that are close uh, at, here, at least here in, uh, in Miami, that we really need to have all this multidisciplinary approach for, 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 for the research, you know? So thank you very much for being part of uh, our team and our conversation. And we will be keeping in, in touch for the next webinar because uh, Josefina said it's going to be next summer. I don't think so. I think that the public really is asking for more. Probably I will be hosting uh, happy hours of sargassum on Friday with a margarita or a martini or something. <laughs> Thank you, Amanda. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Alejandro Bravo is an oceanographer. Uh, is from Mexico. is is part of the you know of the um, oceanographers from my uh, undergraduate in uh, his study at Ensenada, Baja California. Alejandro, do you want to talk? You want to share your experience in Mexico? You are a, Alejandro is a physical oceanographer, so and he has a many and important things to, to communicate with us today. Welcome, Alejandro, and hello from Me to Mexico. <laughs> your audio, okay, you're connecting the audio. Okay, Alex, uh, Alejandro has been working in the parts of uh, complementing the studies of physical oceanography with the barriers. And this is very important because it's, uh, we don't have just to place barriers. So we need to, do, to know where do we have to place barriers. You, we, can, we cannot hear you, Alejandro, you're mute. We can see you, but you're mute. Okay, you now. Me? Okay, welcome. Hi, how are you? Very good. Happy to see all of you here. Well, uh, really, I, I have been studying this uh, sargassum problem since five years ago. I, I did the, the first uh, plan to, to manage the sargassum in Puerto Morelos because it, it was a very big problem to deal with this uh, sar sargassum and no, no one was doing anything. But in these five, five years of experience, looking at this problem, it's very hard to do the, the links, the, the connections between the scientists and the governments and the politicians. So, and, and when that deal, that those links are, are, are done, also the, the fact that these uh, management plans uh, have a lot of money to be in, invested in, you also have that problem because all, all this, this money uh, has to do with uh, other relationship. So this, this money doesn't, doesn't get to the right people and the money goes to other places. And then the next year, uh, well, then the sar sar sargassum goes down. You don't have more sargassum. And then the next year you have one time more the sar 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 sargassum. So every, everyone wants to start to know. So every, every year we, we have to start to know uh, to know how to deal with this, with this problem. Uh, new groups from other parts of Mexico come, from Guadalajara, from Monterrey. They come here to try new techniques to, to deal with the sar sargassum. And the, the ones that were here, uh, they are not taken in account, that they are not um, listen so the experience that that some people can can make uh, it is useful the next year so new people come from other states and they want to to learn how do they want to to deal with it now it is time for the same uh, another um, mexican uh, administration from Sem semar that is the um, marine corps from Mexico, and they are also learning how, how to deal with them. I mean, they are not taking account all the experience that was created here in Mexico. So uh, this is a very pl a complex problem that, all what, what, that, that we are dealing with. Also, the fact that 
uh, every site, every beach, every bay has also different characteristics of how the, the dy dynamics, the bathymetry, the, the currents, the winds, I mean, all these factors, they affect different the, the arrival of, of sargassum. Also, also the interaction between the barriers and the sar sargassum is different. So every place has its uh, particular uh, characteristics. And you, and, and you have to know how the interaction of barriers and sar sar sargassum is made in every special place. I mean, in every bay, in every beach. So the, the complex of this problem is, is one of the, of the biggest com complexity I have ever seen anywhere. And also that it, it affects the, I mean, the, the coral barrier, the, uh, the beach, the sargassum that is collected in, in the beach, it, it is taken to the, uh, to the rain, rain, rainforest and it is put in any places and that they are not prepared with geomembrane. So all the, all the fluids that come out of the, the decomposition of sargassum goes in, into, the, in, into the land and in, it affects the, the water that is on the land. And so, uh, well, it is something that has to be managed in a, in a global manner. And a lot of teams of groups of, of team, team works have, have to be inside. So here in Mexico, it is the only country where I can see that uh, at least uh, I can see, I, I had been in, in meetings where there are the, the, the army, the Marine Corps, the governments, the municipality governments, the state gov governments, and somehow we are learning how, how to deal with this problem. But it is, uh, until now, it is still very, very, very complex to try to address the, the budget to a cer certain project that, that re really works. So I just want to say that Unfortunately, it is something that we as as a human as a human beings have, have have to learn. As Brigitte said, that that we know that we have have to learn how to deal and how to live with this problem. We have to learn how, how to use this orgasm for. Also, I I read in a article from Rosa Rodriguez that the, the, the paths of sar sargassum have different concentrations of metals and of arsenic. So you don't, you don't have a certain characteristic con concentration of the sar sargassum because it is an indicator of the variability of the, of the ocean. So it is also difficult to, to really uh, have an idea, a cer certain idea of what is the real con concentration of the sar sargassum. You, you cannot uh, have a general uh, con concentration of, of metals, of arsenic. Yeah, actually, yes, actually, Alex, uh, I'm going to interrupt you because you know what? The thing is that the technology for analysis, chemical analysis, has been changing. And one of the things that I have noticed with a few of the studies in trace metal analysis is that unfortunately, uh, most of them, they has not, been done, has not been done with the latest technology that allows us to know the real concentrations without interference from another element. So we have to do you know, collaboration because not everybody can be uh, having these tools and the new technology and how to compare. Like for example, right now we, not, we cannot compare data from the late from 1980s to 1990s to 2000s with metals in general because the technology has been changing. So I wanted to talk, you know, like you as a Mexican and also Brigitta and I don't know if anyone else from Mexico are here. Could you put your camera and microphone? Uh, as a Mexican, actually, you, I know because I, uh, my family, part of my family also lives in, in Mexico and my friends are there. I know how those Mexico has been 
uh, suffering in, the gen in general, the public, and what is the, we call the lucha, what is the, you know, the, all the problems that you have been facing as a researchers, as a residents, as a managers, but especially researchers also to try to combine their knowledge with the, um, with the government. So could you please talk more about, uh, uh, about all these uh, lucha, all these fights and everything? And uh, we have here also Valerie Barbosa from the French em embassy. And if there is anyone from the Caribbean, but Brigitta, please, Alejandro, Brigitta. And possibly Valerie also like to say something, but well, it has been very difficult. Uh, in the beginning, of course, there was a lot of denial. Um, fortunately, at least the scientific community has been got a lot in touch with the um, with the press, and I think slowly the awareness that sagasm is not something natural that you have to let nature have its go that it converts into sand, um, et cetera. A lot of uh, common concepts, which uh, in the beginning really were hampering also um, the uh, good management practices. I think slowly these have been turned around. I, uh, at least I think that the general public, especially in, in this part of, of Mexico, where the, the Mexican Caribbean, they're getting more and more and better informed, which I think is a very good, very good aspect. I think the other uh, good aspect is that, uh, including a lot of hotel industries, they realize that they need to go beyond just protecting their own beach. Some of them can, and a lot of them can't because they're too small, but it's, it's more than just putting a barrier in front of your beach and keeping your feet clean because the waters are still getting murky, the reef is still damaged, et cetera, et cetera. So I think those, those are the positive points. Uh, very disappointing has been uh, working with the government because the government in Mexico is very complicated. And there's, um, there's the federal government, there's the, the state government, and then there's the municipalities. And they all have different attributes. They all have different responsibilities. And they don't really communicate very well with each other, and especially this matter. And I think this has been one of the major hurdles we are still trying to tackle. Um, we're getting a sort of integrative management program and even getting a sort of um, legal aspects and how to deal with Chagas to get this done. So I think that's something we're still working on. Yeah, but do you think, Brigitta, that compared with other parts of the Caribbean in Mexico has been advancing a lot because of all the, the, uh, the you know, the integration that you have been doing with uh, the multistextural has been helping? Um, well, there's an advantage, a big disadvantage of um, being a small coast in a large country. A lot of the islands, uh, the islands, they really depend completely uh, of the beach for their, uh, their uh, income. So there's a lot bigger awareness and there are not so many administrative layers. So I think maybe they, they may be able to act even further. But on the other hand, Mexico is a very big country. Uh, the beach is not a big part of the country. There's not a lot of uh, awareness um, about um, what's happening here in the country as a whole. In the state, yes, but not as a country as a whole. So it's still uh, an ongoing process. So I think we have advantages and disadvantages. Mexico, if they really get their mind to it, it, it has the resources, which is good, but it still needs to get an integrative approach. So it, it's, it's a complex problem. Um, there are a lot of um, governance problems which still need to be working on. That's, that's the only thing I can say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brigitta, for your point of view. Valerie, welcome. Where are you coming from? When are you uh, talking uh, from or where are you now? Uh, I'm in Mexico City. Yeah. Oh, you're in Mexico, but yeah, you're I'm part of the Caribbean, right? Oh, you're um, in the French Embassy in Mexico. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to, so we've been, we've been like following, France has been following this uh, sargassum issue quite closely because of the problems mainly in Guadeloupe. 
and in the other islands that are present there. And we have been also um, fostering collaboration between uh, Mexico and France in these areas. So first of all, I would like to start by saying that we really think the effort that has been made by this group, by SARCnet, by Ligia, uh, in integrating the scientific data available and bringing the community together are really very, very valuable. And we're really glad to see how this has been evolving for the last year and the last couple of years. Um, I do agree with Brigida that the awareness of the general public may, um, has increased, definitely, although there are still uh, efforts to be made. Uh, in the case of Mexico, I guess we are facing different um, hurdles, I'd say. So indeed, as Brigitte indicated, there's some governance issues that make it complicated to take care of the, of the problem. Uh, right now, the COVID uh, sanitary crisis has taken over um, on the um, efforts, I guess, mainly from CONACYT, uh, which is like our main um, uh, partner in, in working on this issue. There has been, there have also been uh, great um, budgetary reductions in a lot of public instances, which make our work, our work a little bit more complicated. However, uh, Mexico has joined uh, with the other countries, the French International Cooperation Program, which is called SARCOOP, and which focuses on different issues, especially monitoring the air quality in relation with health and also satellite detection and prediction of the uh, sargassum arrivals. Um, this uh, French group has also managed to um, um, get the program of the environment from the United Nations to integrate um, a resolution concerning sargassum. So this will take place uh, next year and it should increase maybe awareness from the international community and the resources available to work on this area. And um, this uh, regional program also integrates Dominican Republic and we hope that we will have a um, French-Mexican collaboration on a call for research projects, uh, hopefully next year. And that this will also just contribute to sustaining all the efforts that are being made um, to, to address this global issue that can definitely not be addressed by every, each country uh, on its own. So we think that this regional effort that is being made, uh, like uh, headed by the French community, could very well uh, come into contribution and synergy with the efforts that are being made in other parts of the world, and particularly with your, with your group in, uh, in Florida. Yes, thank you very much, Valerie, because yes, definitely we want to be part of the collaboration with the uh, French territories, with the uh, Holland uh, territories and the other Caribbean countries, because surprisingly, you know, being uh, having the, the, the largest research uh, uh, float here in the United States, only, only uh, uh, European uh, countries as, um, as Holland and France has been the ones that has been trying to investigate the source, what is happening, all the physical uh, chemical parameters in the equator in order to know why these blooms are producing. Because it's very important, not just only, this, you know, not only uh, uh, receiving the sargassum. We need to know first why is this producing in order to know if it's possible to stop it. So uh, thank you very much for, for doing that. And definitely, please, uh, we will be keeping in touch in order that uh, we can uh, extend the collaboration with the Caribbean and United States. Uh, yeah, I'm, any, oh, sorry, sorry. I may be sharing in the chat if I still have a couple of minutes. I will just be putting in like a call that has been launched, especially um, dedicated to this monitoring of the air quality. So, yes, I will put there for everyone yes, to check out. Yes, put everything. And I don't remember if uh, Josefina mentioned that we are creating also a list, not only the Sarga, Sarganet, if not so, something more. Um, uh, more regional, no more regional, more just in the United States, in the South Florida, actually. But we can uh, definitely we need uh, expand and, and participate all of us. So we will be having this uh, list and we will send you emails. Thank you very much, Valerie. Uh, Alexandro, so we have to finish soon. So I am just going to, uh, to close this, the webinar. Anything else that you want to, to tell? I just, I just, to I just want to say that, that here the uh, com committee 
is now working on the first uh, norm. Uh, it's a me Mexican law that is going to uh, engage all the all the facts that affect the sargassum in the ocean, in the beach, and in the in the earth. So with this norm, we are we are putting all all these all these facts together. So how how can we manage the sargassum problem? Exactly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexandro. Or Alejandro, actually, I am my, in my Spanglish. So thank you very much for everybody to be in these uh, two uh, webinars, so the webinar series. We're very happy to, uh, to have all of you. We have having uh, an incredible uh, participation. We receive emails. It's, uh, we are overwhelmed, actually, Josefina, Emilio, and I. And I don't know, Emilio, could you show us also your, your camera if you're there? So we really thank you, all of you, because uh, your participation has been extraordinary. And uh, so we have uh, many things that we have to be sharing. Definitely, this is just an open conversation. So we have uh, present the, the point of view of the, how the municipalities are managing our, the sargassum, how does the researchers can provide the different information in order that the manage, management will be correct. And now we need also to have another webinar probably about products. Uh, so the exchange, you know, the, the, I, we extended one, one more hour because we wanted to give the microphone to everybody to express their concerns, to have questions, to exchange, exchange ideas. So thank you very much. Jose, you want to, to finalize this? Um. I don't want to repeat everything, but thank you all for the participation and also uh, stay tuned. We will forward, we will uh, follow an email uh, with an email with information about the listserv and probably a formation of the task force. Uh, thank you all. Thank you everybody and see you soon in another webinar. Thank you. Thank you.